The next life that we're reading is, this is directly from Father Michael Polsky. It's Bishop Leonti of Astrakhan. It's only one page. The mass executions of clergy, workmen and merchants of Astrakhan are attributed to Kirov, who received instructions from Stalin himself. Astrakhan was overcrowded with sick and wounded soldiers of the Red Army, and typhus was raging at the time of the Civil War. Bishop Leonti called a meeting of the representatives of the town and suburban parishes, and it was decided to appeal to the people to, quote, to give help to the sick and wounded of both, end quote, of both the Imperial and Soviet armies. The appeal concluded with the quotation from the New Testament, I was naked and ye clothed me not, I was sick and... The situation in the town was so strained that, that the sick and wounded soldiers of the Great War were thrown out of the hospitals into the streets in order to make room for the members of the Red Army. The Astrakhan communist newspaper printed the appeal. The chairman of the government, Cheka Atarbekov, declared that the quotation from the New Testament was used with the intent to undermine the authority of the communist power. Atar Vekov reported his, uh, reported his opinion to the president of the Revolutionary Committee, known as Revcom, his, uh, whose name was Kirov. The latter ordered, take action. The result was prompt so-called liquidation of the, whoa, the result was prompt liquidation of the Astrakhan clergy, headed by Bishop Leonti and others who participated in the matter of the appeal. Wow, even this, like the, the language that they use, liquidation, when they're talking about killing clergymen. Um, the next life is, again, that's, this is a short one, Bishop Nikodim of Belgorod. Bishop Nikodim of Belgorod had taken no part in politics, but in his sermons he had con condemned violence, robberies, and murders. He had hidden his flock to preserve the teachings of Jesus Christ, proclaiming that the laws of God were above the laws of men. Such sermons enraged the local communist authorities. During the Feast of the Nativity of Christ in 1918, Commandant Sank Sanko, Sainko, known for his cruelty, he killed thousands of men with his own hands, arrested the bishop and took him to the Cheka. But the furor which arose among the, the, the people after the news of the arrest of their beloved bishop forced Sainko to allow the bishop to return to the monastery. Yet on the very day of his liberation, Bishop Nicodem delivered a sermon condemning violence after which he was re-arrested by the same Commandant Sanko, who said at the time that the priests and monks were ruining the... Whoa! Who said at the time that the priests and monks were ruining the revolution. A priest's wife, Kainskaya, addressed Sanko, pleading with him for the bishop's freedom. She was immediately arrested, and in the evening of the same day, whoa, Sanko shot her with, with his own hands and ordered the bishop to be taken to prison. There, in the corner of the prison yard, in the darkness of the night, Bishop Nicodem was executed. In order to hide the fact of his execution from the people, and also fearing a possible refusal of the Red Soldiers to execute the beloved and respected pastor, the bishop was taken to the place of execution dressed in a military overcoat. His body was carried out of town and thrown into the common grave. The rumour of his death reached the people, and re requiem services were performed at that grave daily in his memory. And next is Bishop Makari of Vyazma. The life of Saint Makari as Bishop and Haramata of Orel. Or or Bishop Makarius, in the world, Michael Ginevushev Gyn was born in 1858. In 1882, he graduated from Kiev Theological Academy and became a teacher. Later, he became the Kiev diocesan missionary. In 1918, after the death of, death of his wife, he became a higher monk and superior of the Moscow Vis Visokopetrovsky Visokop Monastery with the rank of Archimandrite. In 1909, he became superior of the Novospassky Monastery. In 1914, he was consecrated Bishop of Balakinsk. On January 28, 1917, he was made Bishop of Oral and Sevsk. On May 26, 1917, he was retired and went to live in the Spaso Avra Avramiev Monastery, Spaso Avramiev Monastery in Smolensk. 
At the beginning of 1918, Vladika Makarius arrived in the city of Vyazma, Smolensk province, and took up re residence in the ancient and well-organized monastery of the Holy Spirit, which was located in the city itself. The church began to fill up with masses of people who came to listen to his inspired sermons, which they later spoke of as being incomparable with anything they had heard before. Of course, the local Bolsheviks could not fail to notice such an enemy. They began to spy on him and tried to do away with him with the help of some appointed murderers. One day, while the bishop was officiating in church, the murderers gathered in the, in the, par, in the parvis, waiting for him to come out in order to fall upon him. But they started a quarrel which turned into a fight, as a result of which one of them was killed. Having been informed of the event, the bishop delivered one of his most striking sermons, which made a shattering and ineradicable, in, which made a shattering and ineradicable impression on the worshippers. The Bolsheviks, having become convinced of the influence that the bishop exerted on the people of the city and its vicinity, decided to strike there and then. One evening in the summer of 1918, a detachment of Reds appeared in the monastery and searched the quarters of the bishop and all the monks. All the bells of the 24 churches of Vyazma to told the alarm, but in vain. The bishop was arrested and brought to the local revolutionary committee, where he was subjected to various indignities and beatings. He was officially charged with having organized a white guard rebellion. The next day, Hiramunk D, Vladika's cell attendant, was summoned to the bishop for confession and communion. He reported that the bishop had bravely endured insults and tortures, the traces of which were still visible on his face and body. He wore a soldier's uniform, his hair had been cut off and his beard shaven. However, the Bolsheviks did not dare to murder Bishop Makarius in Vyazma, where he was too popular and highly respected. It was only later, in the autumn of 1918, that he was taken in great secrecy to Smolensk and shot. According to some statements, the bishop's daughter, dressed as a beggar woman, at great risk to her life, followed her father's way of the cross from, from a distance. His last minutes on earth were reported as follows. The doomed men, 14 in number, with Vladika Makarius among them, were taken to a deserted place on the edge of Smolensk. They were ordered to line up with their backs towards a freshly dug pit. One of the executioners approached each of the prisoners in turn and shot him through the forehead, not in the nape of the neck as was customary. The victims fell one after the other to the bottom of the grave. The bishop was standing at the end of the line, praying fervently with a prayer rope in his hand. If he noticed a weakening in spirit of one of those whom the executioner was approaching, he would leave the line, come nearer to the man, bless him and say with great compassion, go in peace. And so, uh, strong and powerful in spirit, he comforted his weaker brethren until the last of them fell into the grave. Then he stood alone at the edge of the grave. The stars had paled with the coming of dawn. Vladika's fingers quickly moved across his prayer rope. His gaze, full of faith, was directed to the heavens, and the joy and light of the kingdom of God were probably open to the spiritual eyes of the martyr. His lips whispered a last prayer. The executioner slowly went up to Vladika. Suddenly he was perplexed, and his arm holding his revolver was lowered. Perhaps some inner battle was still being fought within his darkened soul. But then his hand made a gesture of denial. His face lost all expression. He clenched his teeth. His hand took aim, a shot rang out, and the hierarch of God fell into his grave. So this is Bishop Plato of Ravel. January 14, 1919 was the day of the martyrdom of Bishop Plato, first national bishop of the Estonian church. He was brutally murdered by the communists in the basement of the credit bank in Yuriev. Bishop Plato, the son of a sacristan of Riga, Riga was born in 1869. Upon graduation from the Ecclesiastical Academy of Petrograd with a master's degree in theology, he was appointed rector of the Estonian Greek Orthodox Parish in Petrograd. During 23 years of service, Father Plato had shown himself to be an able pastor and administrator and was deservedly recognized as one of the best among the clergy of the capital. In 1917, when the Estonian church had an opening at the cathedral in Riga, the clergy and the parishioners unanimously called for Father Plato. The Holy Synod com complied with the wishes of the Estonians and he was ordained bishop on January 13, 1918. Bishop Plato eagerly re began to re-establish order in his diocese, disrupted during the revolutionary outburst of 1917. 
It was a terrifying time. Burglaries, violence, and murders terrorized people. No one was sure of tomorrow, and all were in need of spiritual encouragement and comfort. During the short period of his, act period of his activity, Bishop Plato personally visited 71 parishes, re-establishing the disrupted church life and soothed the perplexed souls with words of love and faith. But the leadership of this wise and benevolent pastor was of short duration. On, 19th of, on the 19th of December 1918, German troops which had occupied Estonia left the town of Tartu, which was formerly called Yuriev. On, on the 21st of December, the town was under the control of the communists who, with their usual cruelty, began the bloody punishment of everyone who was not with them. Bishop Plato resided in Yuriev at the, at the time, recovering from a serious illness. And on January 2nd, he was picked up on the street and locked with many others in the credit bank, which had been turned into a prison. On the 14th of January, the town was liberated by the Estonian White Army, but the communists had time to, to slam the door before leaving, as was their custom. At 10.30 a.m., they selected about 20 people imprisoned at, in the credit bank, took them to the basement vaults of the bank and slaughtered them in a most brutal way. After the retreat of the communists, the basement of the bank revealed about 20 bodies, some of which were, mm. some of which were mutilated beyond recognition. The body of Bishop Plato had seven bayonet and four gun gunshot wounds, one of which had been made with a, with a dum-dum bullet into the right eye. Among those murdered with the bishop in the vaults of the bank in Yuriev were two arch presbyters, N. Be Be Bezansky and M. Blive, one pastor and several merchants of the town. The body of Bishop Plato was taken in a solemn procession to Tallinn, where it was buried near the left wing of the Spaso Preovra Preovrazhensky Cathedral. In 1931, a marble sarcophagus was consecrated and placed on the grave, the expenses for which were paid by the Estonian government and private donations. The date of the death of Bishop Plato and those with him was dedicated to general mourning in free Estonia. Vesper, did you guys have any thoughts to share on, on uh, St. Plato? Short life, but... Uh... A man dedicated to his club from what it seems, uh, with all the problems of being in an area that was both um, at times occupied by the Soviet Union, Russians were living and Estonians were living. So let's let's read what uh, Father Michael has written here. So this is just Archbishop Alarion. Archbishop Alarion died in delirium from typhus in the hospital of the Petrograd prison on December 15, 1929. A most remarkable professor of theology, a wonderful exponent of the gospel and a courageous and firm defender of the true church of Christ, he was indeed a servant of God. The Archbishop was the author of many articles and pamphlets. Much accurate and painstaking, painstaking work had gone into his master's dissertation, Historical Outline of the Dogma of the Church, which was 559 pages long, in which the idea of the unity of Christ's Church was wonderfully and thoroughly analysed and proved both historically correct and in accordance with ecclesiastical canon. He was an eloquent preacher, and the whole Christian population of Moscow used to attend his sermons. He was a devoted helper of Patriarch Tikhon, and at, the, and at the last church convention to be held, he delivered a brilliant speech on the subject of the Patriarchate. Archbishop Alarion died at the age of 44. He was ordained bishop on May 20th, 1920. Well, he was half the revolution. He spent one year in exile in Archangel and, and then six years from 1923 to 1929 in the forced labor camp of Solovsky Island. There, with two bishops and several priests, he worked as fisherman and net maker, all prisoners of the same camp near a small bay on the White Sea, seven miles from the main concentration camp of Solovsky. Solovsky sorry. Archbishop Alarion was full of life, had a wide education, was an excellent preacher orator, choir singer, and a brilliant debater. Always natural, sincere, and open-hearted, he attracted everyone wherever he went and was generally popular. The image of him, tall and broad-shouldered, with luxurious brown hair and a clear, inspired face, long remained in the memory of those who met him. 
years of life together at the camp, years of life together at the camp qualify us to vouch for his true monastic spirit of self-sacrifice and thorough simplicity, his genuine humility and gentleness. He gave away anything that was asked for, personal possessions holding little interest for him. When insulted, he never replied with insults. Gay and cheerful, he never showed annoyance if disturbed suddenly during serious work. He regarded everything with spiritual eyes which saw only the good. The Archbishop was indeed the most popular man in our whole labour camp. Not only army officers, students and professors used, used to seek his company, or he theirs, but the regular criminals as well, among them murderers and thieves who respected him highly. He was often seen in the company of one or another criminal to whom he talked as his equal, exhibiting an interest in every man's profession. Towards the end of the summer, it's professions in quotes, by the way. Towards the end of the summer in 1925, the Archbishop was taken from the camp and sent to Yaroslav prison, but the spring of 1926 found him back again on Solovki Island. The only news he had to tell about his prison life was that he had met agents of the ruling power who controlled the fate of the church. In the Yaroslav prison, the Archbishop, with a purpose of course, was treated with leniency and received many favours. He could obtain and read books. He read the works of the Holy Fathers and wrote many articles which, after prison censorship, he was allowed to give to his friends for safekeeping. Secretly, he visited the quarters of the warden, known as a very good person, where he saw the collection of manuscripts of the underground religious literature, of the contemporary underground Soviet literature, copies of different church administrative documents, and certain bishop's correspondence. The archbishop mentioned his, his time at the Yaroslav isolated detention center as being the best period of his imprisonment, despite his unpleasant meetings with the enemies of the church. The communist agents tried to persuade the archbishop to join the new schism called Gr Gr Grigoryevsky with the idea of discrediting him in the eyes of the religious and also to reinforce the dissenting Grigoryevsky movement as many would have followed the popular archbishop Alerion. But the archbishop remained firm and showed the agents that he understood their designs. The GPU agent told him, it is a pleasure to talk with a clever man. By the way, how much time do you still have to serve in Solovki? Three, three years, three years for Ilarion, so few? For his refusal, the Archbishop received an additional three years after being accused of disclosing government secrets, that is, relating his conversations with the communist agent. From the day of his ordination as Archbishop in 1920, Archbishop Ilarion had, had had less than two years of freedom. He had worked with the Patriarch in Moscow only six months and by, 20, and by the 20th of December 1923 had already been sentenced to Solovki. He arrived at the, at, at the Kempsk labour camp one week before the Nativity Feast. Ordinarily cheerful and brave, he remarked after seeing all the terrors of the camp barracks life and the prison food, we will not come out if you're alive. A priest in prison with Archbishop Alarion said of his last days, he remained in Solovki till 1929. Then the communists decided to exile him forever to Alma Atu in Central Asia. The Archbishop was taken by Etape, Etape, okay, Etape, that is, was transported from one, run, one prison camp to another with a gang of criminals. On the way from the far north to the south, the Archbishop was robbed, had to endure many privations and by the time he arrived in Petrograd was ill and in rags crawling with vermin. He wrote from the Petrograd prison hospital, I suppose I caught the infection somewhere along the way. On Saturday, December 15, my fate will be decided, the crisis of the disease. I doubt I will survive. On that date, December 15, 1929, Archbishop Alarion died. During the night, his body, laid in a rough coffin made hurriedly from, the, from, from some boards, was released to his relatives. When it was open, no one could recognize the archbishop. The sufferings and the imprisonment of the exile had changed the strong, tall and healthy archbishop Alarion into a pitiful white-haired old man. One woman relative fainted. Metropolitan Seraphim brought his own white vestments and mitra. After arraying the body, they placed the archbishop into another better coffin. The Metropolitan himself, with six bishops and a large number of clergy, performed the funeral service of the burial. A choir sang the funeral prayers. Archbishop Alarion was interred in the, in the Novo 
Devihi Monastery. So passed into eternity, this valiant man, so strong in body and spirit, a man who possessed a most wonderful soul, who had been endowed by God with the gift of eloquence to announce his glory. He gave his life for the church of Jesus Christ. So I think the author of this of this book, Father Michael Polsky, was himself a um, someone who had spent time in Soviet camps. And it sounds like from this life that he personally knew uh, Archbishop Alarion. Uh, Vesper, did your grace have any thoughts to share? The creation of Solovki Island is going to be heard again and again in the lives of the new martyrs. Uh, it was a former monastery. It was on an island, so it was cut off. And it became a very big prison. And most of the religious, um, uh, uh, those accused of religious activity, maybe not most, but a good majority of them were sent to the um, the prison of Solovki. Uh, Professor Ivan Andreev, who I mentioned earlier, was also at Solovki, and um, he records many of his experiences there. So um, we'll see that again and again. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that um, this saintly bishop, even before his martyrdom, was able to to attract murderers and thieves. And this is the work of the gospel, to be able to show Christ to all the people, um, not just to the people that we see as good or, or easy to bring into the church, but to um, display the gospel to people that uh, are ousted by society, by their own, uh, uh, um, difficulties for the most part, but um, to be able to bring the word of God to them. Uh, they tried to, to make um, the bishop go with the Gregorists. At the time of the revolution, there were all kinds of fake churches sprouting up. Uh, we know that it's not easy uh, to remove something but it's much easier to replace something. So what happens with uh, uh, the heresy of ecumenism and world orthodoxy? They didn't try to remove uh, orthodoxy, but they tried to replace it with a church that was being formed by Freemasons, by people that uh, weren't concerned about orthodoxy. And so one church would replace the other. Uh, in this case, they were very successful because uh, the majority of the people that were called orthodox uh, saw nothing wrong because we, we were already, the 20th century was already a time when people weren't that concerned. And so they started to, um, to move towards um, any replacement that you can think of, uh, so uh, so that's that's what happens. The real church is replaced with something that is um, uh, easier and something that uh, that has been created just to replace the church. So we're resuming the New Martyrs of Russia, and we're next reading the life of Metropolitan Arseny of Novgorod. And this is only a, a basically a one pager. The Metropolitan of Novgorod Arseny, one of the best known and most worthy of the Russian hierarchs, died in Tashkent in February 1936. He was born on January 22nd, 1862, in Kishinev. He graduated from the local seminary and for a while served as a teacher in his native district. Then he enrolled in the Academy of Kiev, graduated from it as one of the most brilliant students, and soon received his master's degree. He was appointed inspector of the Moscow Academy in 1897 and later became rector of that institution. In 1899, he was promoted to the rank of vicar of the Metropolitan of Moscow. 
In 1904, he obtained his doctor's degree and three years later was elected a member of the Council of State. In 1910, he was Archbishop of Novgorod and kept that ancient Russian see throughout the revolution. In 1917, at the election of the Patriarch of Russia, he was listed as one of the three candidates for the Patriarchate. On November 23, 1917, he was promoted, together with Archbishop Anthony, to the rank of Metropolitan by the Church Council. He was one of the closest and most faithful helpers of Patriarch Tikhon, and at times assumed the task of the Patriarch's plenipotentiary. He was exiled several times to Siberia and, and Turkestan. Metropolitan Arseni preserved his loyalty and fidelity to the Russian church all through the years of bitter trials it had to endure. He died in exile, professing the true Orthodox faith. He spent 11 months in one of the GPU prisons, waiting to be executed. He was later condemned to exile in Turkestan, from where he wrote a fearless letter to Metropolitan Sergi, head of the dissenting church, protesting against the latter's conciliatory attitude towards the godless powers and rejecting any possibility of compromise. Certain bishops who had joined the new sect took upon themselves the terrible role of GPU inter intermediaries. I don't reread that sentence again. Certain bishops who had joined the new sect took upon themselves the terrible role of GPU intermediaries. Archbishop Evdokim Meschersky, Metropolitan of the Schism, tried to persuade Metropolitan Arseni from within the rank of the GPU to join the so-called New Church. Metropolitan Arseni argued with his former colleague at the Moscow Academy, saying, but you know that the New Church is a lawless church. What can you do? They demand it, said Archbishop Evdokim, nodding his head towards the door of the GPU agent. As Metropolitan Arseni remained unmoved, Archbishop Evdokim exclaimed angrily, well then, go and rot in this prison. With these words, he left the prisoner to his fate. Did you guys have any thoughts to share? It was a very short life. It's short, very powerful, very scary to think that we have the strength to, to always join, choose Christ. The next chapter is Metropolitan Anatoly of Odessa. Metropolitan Anatoly of Odessa should be especially glorified for his spiritual courage in the grievous years of 1928 to 1937. He lived in the south of Russia and was respected for his spiritual deeds and his fearless professing of the true Russian faith. Metropolitan Anatoly suffered a slow martyrdom from the hands of the communists who cruelly persecuted and humiliated him. Even before entering high school, he dedicated his life to the service of God. After high school, he was accepted by the Academy of Kiev and while studying there, took the vows of monkhood. Soon after graduating from the Academy, the Reverend Anatoly was ordained bishop. Bishop Anatoly, young and inspired, won the hearts of his spiritual children. His ever-increasing popularity was noted, of course, by the usurpers of power of the Russian government. Bishop Anatoly was one of the first to be arrested by the communists. For a long time, he languished in the prisons of the GPU. During the hours of questioning, the mild prelate was uh, the mild prelate was outrageously beaten by. Uh, okay, the mild is in in temperament. Okay, during the hours of questioning, the mild prelate was outrageously beaten by magistrates to the point that his jaw was permanently injured, so that his speech at times was not quite distinct. Two of his ribs were also injured. Bishop Anatoly spent a long time in the prison hospital. His wounds had hardly healed when he was exiled to Solovki to the harsh conditions of a labor camp for the most dangerous political so-called criminals, especially, especially from the clergy. Severe frosts, lack of satisfactory nourishment and too heavy labor broke the health of the already not too robust bishop. He suffered this oppressive life for seven years. He owed his survival there only to the most unselfish care of his younger sister, whom he had raised as a daughter. She had left everything to follow her brother into exile. Upon release from exile, Bishop Anatoly was prompted, sorry, was promoted to the rank of Archbishop of Saratov and Samara. Shortly after this, he was taken ill with an ulcer of the stomach, the result of hardship suffered while at the labor camp. Upon recovery, he was appointed head of the Odessa Kherson Diocese in the south. He arrived in Odessa in the darkest hour of its, of its existence. 
all religious affairs were in the hands of the NKVD inspector of the, inspector of the cults, Vishnegorodsky Vishnego, at, at first, and later Baranovich. Both of them fully enjoyed using their power to an inconvenience and humiliate the head of the local churches. The archbishop was frequently ordered to get out of bed in the middle of the night and report to the NKVD headquarters. Sometimes the inspectors would appear in church during solemn services on an, on an important holy day, on an important holiday, and issue the same order. In such instances, the otherwise meek and humble Archbishop Anatoly would curtly tell them that under no circumstances would he stop the church ritual, that he would come only after officiating in the church. His refusals were so positive that even the NKVD messengers gave up, inwardly furious. At the end of four or five hours of church service, the Archbishop would hurry to the NKVD without time to rest or eat. There he was kept waiting for one or two hours more just to repay him for the delay. When he was finally received, Baranovich would stamp his feet and shout at the Archbishop just as if he were a disobedient slave. Such were the conditions under which this highly respected priest carried on his spiritual work. The hardest trial for him was the arrest of almost all the clergy and the best preachers of Odessa in 1931. All of them, more than 20, were exiled during the same year when the sacrilegious closing and destroying of the churches started. The majestic cathedral of the Transfiguration was blown up before the eyes of the Archbishop, as was the beautiful church of the Archangel Michael in the De Vici Monastery, the military, the military cathedral of St. Sergi, and the churches of the port and many others. The repressions and persecutions of the clergy increased, uh, leaving clergymen without food and lodgings. They found refuge in the Archbishop's home, while he himself went about to different government organisations, pleading humbly for assistance and mercy for his unfortunate colleagues, but he was met only with mockery and insults. In 1932, Archbishop Anatoly was promoted to the rank of Metropolitan. He remained head of the Odessa Kurson Diocese until his, until his arrest in August 1936. Before his arrest, Metropolitan Anatoly had to suffer the humiliation of being dismissed by Baranovich and forbidden to perform church services. Upon his arrest, Metropolitan Anatoly was removed to Kiev, where he was kept under severe conditions for about six months. He again suffered from ulcer of the stomach with complications which affected his legs. Metropolitan Constantine, exarch of the Ukraine, succeeded in obtaining permission for him to see his sister before he left for exile. The poor woman later told, with sobs, how Metropolitan Anatoly was led into the room of their meeting, supported on both sides, having nearly lost the complete use of his legs. In spite of his condition, Metropolitan Anatoly was taken into exile by Etape. Um, it's like an accented E and then T-A-P-E, by Etape or Etape, I don't know. He was purposely placed among the gangs of the worst criminals who systematically robbed him on the way. The sick prelate was actually forced by gun butts to walk from one stop to another, farther and farther to the north, with no time to rest. When he collapsed, when he collapsed in a dead faint, he was lifted onto a truck, but as soon as he regained consciousness, he was forced again to walk. Men who witnessed the tortures of the saintly man later declared with tears that it would have been more merciful to have shot him on the spot. On the way, Metropolitan Anatoly caught Krupus pneumonia, but even this did not stop his tragic march. By winter he had reached the place of his place of exile, and in the far north, dying, he pleaded for permission to see his sister, who had managed to reach his place of exile. The sister had received only postcards from him on which he had written, I beg you to do everything you can, plead, pray, implore, but obtain the permission for our meeting. I yearn before my death to see your dear face and bless you but the meeting was not to be, the permission was refused. When Metropolitan Anatoly was on the point of dying, the communists came to him and demanded his gospel and his priest's cross. The gospel was snatched from out of his weakened hands, but he clung to his cross. Protecting it on his chest with numbed hands, he fell back and died in 1938. His body was thrown into a common grave in the frozen earth of the far north. Chapter 15, Archbishop Eugene or Evgeny. 
Archbishop Eugene, the head of the Blaga, Blagoveshensk Diocese, was sent to Solovki at the beginning of 1924. He was the senior bishop there and remained such by general consent, even when higher dignitaries of the church were exiled to Solovki. He was an outstanding servant of the church. Many members of his former Blagoveshensk Blago, Blago parish managed to cross the Siberian border to China and are now scattered all over the world, but they still preserve the sacred memory of their pastor. The Archbishop was arrested in 1923 at one o'clock on the eve of the Feast of the Dormition of the Holy Virgin. On the eve of the holiday, he officiated at the cathedral, giving blessings to thousands of people who approached him for the last time. The people knew that the arrest of this pious and courageous Archbishop who had unmasked the revolutionary and godless injustice was imminent. After the service, the cathedral square was filled with people who left only a narrow path for the Bishop to reach his house. On the morning of the holiday, when the beloved Archbishop did not appear to officiate at the liturgy, great masses of people gathered in front of the GPU building demanding to see him in order to make sure that he had not been murdered. A prosecutor of the Soviet tribunal who came out to quiet the people found himself in danger of being beaten by the crowd. Firemen were called to disperse the crowd with water hoses. It must be noted that the crowd consisted not only of, par of his parishioners, but of other sects too, Molokans, Baptists and others, who were almost as numerous in that town as the Greek Orthodox. They all deeply respected the bishop for his Christian love of peace and justice. Immediately after the demonstration, the Archbishop was secretly removed from the GPU to the city, pr city prison, and at the same time, 54 people, mostly women, were arrested and accused of inciting a riot. A certain Mrs. Medvedev was named as a ringleader. None of those who had been arrested ever returned home. Five town priests, who were later exiled to Mur Murom for two years, had been arrested together with the Archbishop. The people's activity on behalf of their Archbishop continued. Every day a cart passed the town streets with a sign, bread to the prison for the Archbishop. So much food was collected that the Bishop was able to feed almost the whole prison. People watched the prison and the railroad station, but the communists distracted their attention and succeeded in removing the Archbishop to Chita and from there to Moscow. In Moscow, the bishops were usually set free for a short time. So was Bishop Eugene, and a person of authority managed to whisper into his ear, you will be set free, but do not go to see Patriarch Tikhon. The GPU was then looking for dissent and insubordination on the part of the clergy in its loyalty to the Patriarch. But of course, Archbishop Eugene immediately went to pay his respects to the Patriarch and was soon arrested and exiled to Solovki. There he grieved and worried about his flock. A bishop of the dissenting church, a certain Daniel, tried without success to seize the cathedral of his former diocese. But its own deacon, Longin Grekov, after Vespers, on the, eve of Saint, uh, on the eve of Saints Peter and Paul Day, together with members of the local checker, carried away all the valuables of the cathedral, and on the same night the, ancients, the ancient wooden cathedral burned to ashes. No one tried to extinguish the fire. The deacon published in the newspapers the surrender of his rank and invited the clergy to follow his example. Archbishop Eugene spent three years in the Solovki labor camp, then was exiled to the Zoran region also for three years. In 1929, he was released, his residence being limited to Kotel, Kotelnichi under the Vyatka administration, and he later administered the Perm Diocese. There is no record of whether or not he had been able to perform his duty without any interruption on the part of the communist authorities. But in 1937, while a general liquidation of bishops was being carried out, and less than 10 of them had been left in all Russia, Archbishop Eugene, who was by then Metropolitan of Nizhny Novgorod, was arrested, and no one has ever heard of him since. His divine service was always majestic, quiet, and filled with holy awe and veneration. The congregation felt it and lived it, getting a great spiritual satisfaction from it. He was a man of fasting who kept, who kept Lent even when prison life made the choice of food impossible. He appeared to be of a delicate build, but he always wore the coarse plain underwear, which it was difficult to get even in those days. He was a highly educated man, a learned theologian, a man who could discuss with competence any theoretical problem, who also possessed practical wisdom and was always tactful and calm. 
If he wanted to rep reprimand some priest, he would do it privately in a tactful and gentle way. Those who lacked true faith or wavered were sent home convinced. Those who grieved were comforted and encouraged. He possessed the charisma of true spiritual power. Such was Archbishop Eugene, the head and the representative of the Solovki prisoners at that time. From 1923 to 1926, 24 bishops suffered exile on Solovki Island, and many more arrived there in the autumn of 1926, but not one of them had apparently survived that terrible period of 1937, when a new wave of arrests and murders swept across Russia. We know the fate of only three or four of them, and they are not among the living. That's the end of this life. So I, I can't remember when, when these lives were written, but I think around 1940, 1950s. So this next chapter is chapter 16, and it's called General Register of a Part of the Russian Episcopate Who Suffered Martyrdom from the Hands of Communists During the Persecution of the Church. Metropolitan Vladimir of Kiev killed January 25, 1918. Archbishop Andronik of Perm killed June 4, 1918. Archbishop Yermagen of Tobolsk drowned in river June 19, June 19, 1918. Archbishop Basil of Chernigov shot in Perm. Bishop Ephraim of Sel Selenginsk shot August 23, 1918. Bishop Theophan of Solikamsk drowned in the river Kama December 11, 1918. Bishop Isidor Kolo Kolokolov of Mikhailov killed in Samara by being placed in a pile. Bishop Ambrose Gudko of Seroopolsk killed in Sviatsk by being tied to a horse's tail. Archbishop Mitrofan Krasnopolsky of Astrakhan thrown from a high wall and smashed to death. Bishop Leonti Vimpfen of Enoteev killed, thrown into a hall, hole and refused burial services. Bishop Plato of Ravel killed in I I Iuriev, January 14, 1919. Archbishop Tikhon of Voronezh hung on the altar gates of the Church of the Monastery of St. Mitrofan in December, in December 1919. Archbishop Joachim Levitsky of Nizhny, Nizhny Novgorod died suspended with the head down in the Cathedral of Sevastopol. Bishop Nikodim Kon Kononov of Belgorod mutilated and tortured to death by blows on the head with an iron bar and then thrown into the garbage pit. Given burial only half a year later when he was recognized among other corpses by his vestment of a monk. Others say after torture buried alive in lime. Bishop Makari Genevyshev of Vyazma, Bishop Lavrenti Knyazev of Balak Balakna, Bishop Pimen of Verni, Bishop Her Herman of Kamichen, Bishop Varsanufi Vivelin of Kirillov, Archbishop Just Justin of Omsk and Pavlograd died in prison in Omsk in Ma March 1920. Bishop Methody of Petropavlovsk Petro killed in the spring of 1921. The murderers thrust his priestly cross into the bayonet wound in his chest. Bishop Simon Shleyev of Ufa shot at home Janu July, 6, July 6, 1921. Metropolitan Nazari of Kutais, taken from his sick bed and shot for presenting the petition to save Russia from communist violence to the Genoa Conference. Metropolitan Benjamin of Petrograd, executed August 12, 1922. Bishop Filaret of Kostroma, froze to death in exile in the province of Archangel in 1922. Bishop Serafim of Elutorov, Tobolsk Diocese, died in exile in the Perm region about 1925. Bishop Yerofey Afonik of Veliki Ustinsk, shot in the head during his arrest when the crowd tried to defend him, arrested for refusal to obey Metropolitan Sergei of Moscow and his order to pray for the Soviet government. Archbishop Peter Zverev of Voronezh, died in the Solovki camp January 27, 1929. Archbishop Ilarion Troitsky died in prison in Petrograd December 15, 1929. Bishop Sergei of Efremov, Efremov 
shot to death in B Buzuluk in 1929. Metropolitan Seraphim Hesheriakov Hesh of the Caucasus, shot to death in prison in Rostov on Don in 1932. Archbishop Afanasi Saharov of Starobelsk, shot to death in the Kharkov prison in 1932. Archbishop Agapit Vishnevsky of Ekaterinoslav, died in prison from hunger and typhus. Archbishop Alexander Belozarov died in prison in Rostov in 1932. Archbishop Ambrose Polyansky of Podolsk died in 1934 from exposure to sun and intestinal disease in the famine steppes of Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, yeah, okay, Kazakhstan while being taken from Chikmet to a remote, to a remote village. Bishop Philip Gumilevsky shot to death in the Kras, Krasno, Krasnoyarsk prison in 1934 for refusing to accept the authority of Metropolitan Sergei. Archbishop Arseny Jadanovsky of Serpukhov shot to death June 30, 1935. Bishop Damaskin of Glukhov died in exile in Siberia in 1935, according to some from frost on the ferry when crossing a river, according to others in prison from gangrene of frostbitten feet. Metropolitan Peter of Kretitz died in imprisonment in December 1936. Bishop Bartholomew Romov shot to death January 26, 1936. Metropolitan Anatoly of Odessa died in imprisonment February 10, 1938. Metropolitan Joseph Petrovich of Petrograd shot to death late in 1938 for encouraging secret wandering clergy. Archbishop Dmitry Lyubimov of Gdovsk shot to death in 1938 for same for the same others say he died in the novgorod prison in 1936. bishop alexei vicar of petrograd shot to death in 1938 for the same bishop seraphim shot to death in aktiobinsk in 1938. bishop petirim krilov formerly of the solovki monastery shot to death in 1938. Archbishop Juvenal Maslovsky of Ryaz Ryazan shot to death in 1938. Bishop Nikon Prolevsky of Belgorod shot to death in 1938. Bishop Nikon Lebedev shot to death in 1938. Metropolitan Nikanda Fenomenov of Odessa died in exile. Metropolitan Arseny Stadnitsky of Novgorod died in exile in spring 1936. Metropolitan Kirill Smirnov of Kazan died in exile in 1936. Metropolitan Seraphim Chichagov of Petrograd was sick when arrested, carried away on a stretcher because of hemorrhage, was imprisoned for about a year, died or was shot to death in 1930-32. Archbishop Makari killed in the peskovo Pechersky Monastery, April 1st, 1944, during the air raid by communists. Archbishop John Poma of Riga can be, can, can be entered into this register as a martyr killed by communists abroad near Riga on October 12th, 1934. This register shows the fate of only a few, a little over 50 bishops, while it is known that over 250 bishops suffered reprisals from the communists. At present, only five of these are known to be at liberty and serving under the Moscow Patriarchate, including the present Patriarch himself. A chance statement of a former Cheka agent. Uh, I don't know what this um, abbreviation is. SOC dot. I don't know what that SOC stands for. SOC. Um, SOC. SOC. SOC v. Uh, so a chance statement from a former Cheka agent. SOCV um, on August 20, 1946, told us that in the Perm camps, for example, in 1945, 10 bishops were imprisoned and only one of them was freed on certain definite conditions. Thus, the fate of 200 bishops is not precisely known, but on the whole, it should be considered that more than 250 bishops have already perished or are perishing in different places of imprisonment or exile. As it happened in the early days of Christianity, there were some who fell under the oppression. Some renounced religion, uh, cr uh, Christian or any other, as did Bishop Nikon Beznosov of Kras Kras Krasnoyarsk and Archbishop Zosima of Rakutsk, 
and join the ranks of the godless uh, and join the ranks of the godless. Especially noteworthy is Bishop Theophil of Ekat Ekaterinodar and Kuban, who, at the request of the GPU, turned in a list of names of all the secret monks of his diocese, and when these were arrested, the bishop hung himself in 1930. Others came to terms with the communists and for the sake of the communist government slandered, lied, betrayed, and even justified the persecution of the church itself. The foremost of these are the bishops of the renovation sect, false metropolitan Alexander, Videnski, Antonin, and some others. Then the Moscow Patriarchate itself, starting with Metropolitan Sergei, who submitted to the government, and later Patriarch Alexei. These pushed the early renovators out of existence by performing their function for the communist government. The bishops who were freed by the communists from prison and exile found themselves in a, ha in a helpless position and were forced to recognize the government church, but were completely destroyed in the reprisals of 1937. The Moscow Patriarchate continues to exist at the cost of just uh, at the cost of justifying all the evil doing of the communist government and insulting the memory of the martyrs of the church. And that's the end of this chapter. Um, did your grace have any thoughts to share? My only thoughts were, look how God uh, brings back, uh, allows to be the days of martyrdom of the early Christians to be brought back and even our times. If you read these lives, they can be compared to the first martyrs. They can be per compared to the, the martyrs uh, under the Turkish uh, yoke after the fall of Constantinople. Um, these are cycles where God um, decides to add some new stars to the sky, new martyrs. That's what I mean. Is it possible? Is it possible for any people to do these things if they didn't hate Christ? I don't. I don't. I'm just thinking. Like, is it? Is it actually possible? Is that what really fueled all of this? This treatment of the bishops. It is hatred for Christ, and we see our society is full of hatred for Christ. Some people might not even be aware that they're they hate Christ, but they basically do. They don't love Christ, so they don't love His Church. The only the thought that keeps occurring to me um, is uh, actually, you know, when I am tempted by, I'm, I thank God, no, perhaps not at length. But it was it's part in part because of because of the knowing about this these events, um, you know, that as as soon as I remember, as soon as I, my mind turns to these uh, these martyrs um then the, it's, to me it's obviously it's a source of great sorrow but also a source of great strength i cannot turn away when i remember uh uh these what these people had to go through there's something about this which is just a proof of the holiness of the of the church that the, this attack against it could be so sustained uh and for what I think you contributed two very uh, big things, Rita Timothy. The first is um, uh, that the the strength that we should receive when we um, uh, when we read these martyrdoms to be strong, not only to be shocked, not only to feel sad for the martyrdoms, but to draw strength from that. And also that certainly such persecution is a sign that um, it's the true church. Arch Presbyter Ivan Kotorov, the first victim among the Russian clergy. An academy graduate, Father Ivan arrived in the USA in 1901 and conducted the divine services in Chicago, where he built the cathedral one of the best in that country. The revolution later caught him in Sarsko Selo, a suburb of Petrograd. Blooming with health and strength, cheerful in his relations with people, he was a direct and courageous man. Once, when he openly reproved some red sailors for wickedness, the mob fell upon him, 
beat him and dragged him barely alive along the railroad tracks until he died. The Moscow Holy Council, ending its first session on the 8th of December 1917, published a letter sympathizing with the widow of the murdered one, and by this recorded the first martyrdom among the Russian clergy, of which there were many later. The next account is Arch Presbyter A. Skipatrov, first victim among the Petrograd clergy. Arch Presbyter A. Skipatrov, rector of the Church of Saints Boris and Gleb, by which stood the famous chapel of the Theotokos, Joy of All Who Sorrow, was well known in the thickly populated Kalashnikov districts of Petrograd. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims, mostly common people, flocked to the miracle working icon of the Theotokos, in the face of which five little coins had been embedded from times unknown by someone seeking consolation and comfort. The chapel had a high moral significance for the people of Petrograd, and Arch Presbyter Skipatrov enjoyed great influence and, of course, was a strong enemy of the communists, whose regime he boldly denounced in his sermons. The frightened and confused population of the capital began to stream into churches seeking shelter. The communists decided to strike at their religious feelings. A large detachment of red sailors and soldiers appeared at the walls of Alexander Nevsky Lavra, a creation of Peter the Great, and at the entrance of the stately Snow White Cathedral and the cells of the monks in the Lavra. The agents of the Cheka wanted to inspect the silver coffin in which lay the relics of St. Alexander Nevsky. Then the aged Father Skipatrov appeared on the porch of the church wearing his vestments and carrying a hand cross. His animated eyes flashed with anger, his long white hair, like an ancient prophet's, waved in the breeze. In vain he tried to stop the armed men, but a command sounded, bullets pierced his body and he fell at the entrance of the church. The agents coolly stepped over his body and entered the church. The body of the pastor lay on the porch until evening, his head shattered by a gun butt. The next account is Arch Presbyter Philosoph Onatsky. The second of the Petrograd clergy to perish at the hands of the communists was the popular rector of the Kazan Cathedral, Arch Presbyter Philosoph Onatsky. He was a brilliant preacher orator, a well known civic leader, a great contributor to charity, and the founder of many orphan asylums. After the communist October Revolution, Father Ornatsky continued to be the rector of the Kazan Cathedral and became the refuge for those seeking consolation in religion. Communists watched diligently over his activities and in order to intimidate the fearless old man, arrested his two sons, officers of the guard, who were later shot to death. In the spring of 1918, Cheka agents appeared at the lodging of the pastor and took him to Gorokovskaya No. 2, Cheka. The day before, Father Onatsky had performed a requiem liturgy in the cathedral for the victims of the communist terror. Executions by a firing squad had become common occurrences by then. The parishioners of the cathedral became alarmed at the fate of their pastor. Several delegations were formed, which the communists would not receive. Finally, one day after the liturgy, in the garden in front of the cathedral, there gathered a crowd of many thousands, mostly women, who, singing prayers, bearing standards and icons, moved up the Nevsky Prospect to Gorokovaya Street to free Father Philosoph. A delegation came out of the crowd, which the communists received, and assured that Father Onatsky would soon be liberated, that he was in a cell on Gorokovaya, completely safe. On that very night, however, Father Philosoph Onatsky was shot to death. The author of these statements during his wandering through Russia happened to meet a worker from the Obokov factory, a locksmith, Pavlov, who was also a driver and, a tr and had transported Father Onatsky and a large group of others to the place of execution. Persuaded to speak openly, he said, what could I do? I had to take people to, I had to, take people to their death. I was drafted for that purpose, but I could not do it when I was sober. I could not refuse to do it. It would have been the end of me. Well, you drink a bottle of alcohol, the strongest you can get, and drive them. The agents of the Cheka were free with alcohol. When sober, you could not take the car for such an assignment. I recall clearly the ride with Father Onatsky. Father Onatsky died like a saint. 
that night we picked up 32 men from different prisons. We were told that they were all officers of the Imperial Army. Some were young, some were gray-haired. One was saying that he was Colonel of the Guards and was cursing the Communists strongly. You will all perish, maybe 20 years later, but you will perish like dogs. Russia will be Russia again, but you will perish. The escorts were silent, listening. Father Onatsky tried to quiet the Colonel, saying that they were all going to their God. Here, accept my pastoral blessing and listen to the holy prayers. And he began to read what was appropriate, the service for the dying. He was reading it clearly in an unwavering voice and blessing everyone. It was a dark, rainy night. The victims were praying. Fear was getting hold of me and my head began to clear. I had been ordered to take them, to, take them beyond Ligovo to the bay. We drove a long time and Father Onatsky was saying prayers all the time. At a spot on the shore, we unloaded and lined them up. The agents of the checker, already waiting, approached with revolvers and shot each one in the nape of the neck. The Reverend Father was knocked down by a gun butt and then shot in the head. All the bodies were thrown into the sea. Later, I was told that the body of Father Onatsky did not sink and was thrown out by the waves on the shore near Oranienbaum. There, they say, it was secretly buried by the inhabitants. This is Arch Presbyter John Vostorgov. John Vostorgov, the son of a priest in the, in the village of Kirpilsko of the Stavropol Diocese, was born January the 20th, 1864. He had lost his father at an early age, but remembered him with great affection and spoke of him as having been too kind and gentle. A silent and modest man, his father was loved by his parishioners, whom, when he died, did not abandon his family. They persuaded his widow to remain at the parish as a prosperer baker and helped her to raise her three children. Her two boys graduated from the Stavropol Seminary and her girl from a boarding school. After his graduation, John Vostorgov was anxious to continue his education, but he had to cope with more vital problems. He therefore accepted a job as teacher of Russian grammar. In 1887, he was ordained priest and appointed to the parish of his native, native village. The young priest did not stay long in the village. He was soon recommended to a, to a school in Stavropol as a teacher of Holy Scripture, from which he was later transferred to the Georgia region and assigned as a missionary. Father John Vostorgov studied the Persian language and went to Persia, where he devoted his time to the conversion of natives to the Orthodox Christian faith. He was called to Moscow and soon assigned by the Holy Synod to be a synodal, synodal missionary preacher, a position he held to the day of his martyrdom. Father John Vostorgov was an outstanding man of vast intellect who possessed an extraordinary ability as preacher and writer. The government confronted the church with the difficult problem of serving the spiritual needs of, the, of people migrating to the virgin lands in Siberia and of arranging church services in the new settlements. Priests were scarce, yet it was necessary to train a new clergy within a year's time in order to meet the requirements, and that task had been entrusted by the Holy Synod to Father Vosorgov. This man of extraordinary mind and great energy succeeded in his difficult task by selecting capable psalm readers and village teachers and preparing them for priesthood by means of special seminar courses. Particularly striking were the results he obtained in teaching his students to preach. By applying his method, the pupils were able to acquire the oratorical skill of a preacher within a year. The revolution was a terrible blow to Father John Vostorgov, but he was not a man to fall into despondency. He was the rector of the Pokrov Cathedral, better known as St. Basil's at that time. The Moscow citizens knew that by attending the services in that cathedral, they would absorb spiritual vigor while listening to the words of truth. With a masterful touch, he spoke fearlessly and clearly of the dreadful subjects which marked those days. But he also comforted by calling all to prayer and faith in God and advised people how to live in such times. Upon leaving church, people felt that indeed, in the name of God, their souls had been renovated and strengthened, that they were ready to endure with forbearance the evil which had invaded the Russian land. In the summer of 1917, Father Vostorgov even succeeded in publishing a weekly newspaper. When, in October 1917, the communists became masters of the situation, 
Father Voss Dorgov began to accuse them of being evil, knowing perfectly well that agents of the Cheka were among the crowd to listen to him. On Sunday at four o'clock, he celebrated a Thanksgiving service on the Red Square near the cathedral. He accused the communists again of knowing he would be heard by the agents on their way to the Kremlin. He fully anticipated his end as a martyr. In the summer of 1918, the Reverend Voss Dorgov was arrested. The, parish, the parishioners continually supplied him with food, though they were in need of it themselves. He was allowed to perform services in the prison church, and many went there to pray. The hour of death is the test of our faith, and that of Father Voss Dorgov testified to his steadfast belief in, the, in God and the strength of his convictions, to which he had devoted his entire life. He died the valiant death of a Christian martyr. Here is an account of the execution by a firing squad of Father Voss Dorgov and some members of the cabinet shot together with him. About half a year ago, I happened to meet a person who was confined in the Butersk prison of Moscow during the whole of 1918. One of the most distressing duties of the prisoners was the burying of the victims of the last execution and digging ditches for the victims of the next. This work was done day in and day out. Prisoners were taken out in a truck with an armed escort to the Hodinsk field sometimes the Vagankov Cemetery. A supervisor would measure out a ditch the width of a man, the number of victims to be shot determining the length. The graves were dug for 20 to 30 men, sometimes more. The forced laborers never saw the bodies because they were lightly covered with dirt by the executioners before their arrival. The prisoners had only to fill the ditches with the continual victims of the Cheka. I served as a grave digger for several months, the prisoners became friendly with the guards to such an extent that the latter shared their impressions with them on the current operations. Once, at the end of the digging of the usual long, single row ditch grave, the guards announced that on the next morning, August 23rd, 1918, there would be an important execution of priests and members of the cabinet. Next day, everything was explained. The condemned persons were Bishop Ephraim, Archpresbyter of Vostorgov, Pastor Lutostansky with his brother, N.A. Uh, N.A. Matlakov, Secretary of the Interior, U.C. Shiglovitov, Chairman of the State Council, another former Secretary of the Interior, A.H. Vostov, and Senator C.P. Beletsky. As soon as the victims arrived, they were placed on the edge of the grave facing it. Upon request from Father Vostorgov, the executioners allowed the condemned to pray and to say farewell to each other. Everyone knelt and an ardent prayer flowed from the unfortunates, after which they received a last blessing from the most reverend Ephraim and Father Vostorgov. Father Vostorgov said a few words to the others, urging them all with faith in God's mercy and the early revival of Russia to give themselves as the, the last redeeming offering. He was the first to walk boldly to the grave. I am ready, he said, addressing the guards. Everyone took his place at the edge of the ditch. An executioner came to Father Boss Dorgov, stood behind his back, took his left arm, turned it behind at his waist, and placing his revolver to the back of the neck, shot him, at the same time pushing him into the grave. Other executioners approached the other victims. Beletsky suddenly jumped aside and quickly ran towards the bushes, 20 to 30 paces, but was hit by two bullets and dragged to the, get, to the grave, shot to death and thrown in. From the words of the guards, my companion understood that while the executioners threw dirt over their unfortunate victims, they talked and expressed great wonder at Father Vostorkov and N.A. Maklakov, who evidently astounded them with their coolness before the dreadful moment. I.G. Sheglovitov moved with difficulty, but did not show the least sign of fear. Later, when Father John's parishioners came to the spot of the murder, not far from the Bratskos cemetery, the ditch was full of the blood of the victims. They scattered flowers and wept, recalling this truly good pastor. This account uh, is of Lev Zakharovich Kuncevich of the Diocesan Ministry of Voronezh. A graduate of two schools of higher education, a university and an ecclesiastical academy, Kuncevich, though a man of the world, served the church as an anti-sectarian missionary. 
a tragic death occurred, occurred in Cherny ER on the Volga. He had an order from the church administration to read a message from the Most Holy Patriarch Tikhon in which the latter anathematized the communists. On the day of the reading, the crowd in church was so large that he was forced to read it, not in church, but on the porch in front of all the people. There were, of course, many communists among the crowd who reported to the communist center. The fighting line of the civil war came nearer to the town. The communists blustered and stormed. The Cheka agents raged. The population was forbidden to go anywhere without special permit. Some succeeded in leaving the town, and Mrs. Kunsevich also went to the Cheka, trying to leave Cherny Ayar. Upon receiving her request and finding out the identity of her husband, the agents were happy to get such a catch. They told her that her husband would receive a permit immediately as soon as he appeared in person. After some hesitation, the two of them went to the Cheka, from which Kunsevich never returned. It was about July 20th, 1918. He was kept in prison for two months. It is not necessary to mention all the abuses and torments he was subjected to while in prison, but the most despicable act was that one hour before his execution, the agents permitted his wife to visit him, raising her hopes for a reprieve. She was crying with happiness, believing in his early liberation. And one hour after the visit, passing through the square, she saw her husband tied to a stake being executed by red soldiers. Seeing that, she lost her mind. The peasants of the village of Stadetskol took her in and fed her by turns. Uh, this is called The Case of Moscow Clergyman. On May the 10th, 1922, Moscow newspapers published the sentence of the court concerning the persons accused in the incitement against the confiscation of church valuables. Moscow priests, Zoazersky, Dobrobolov, Nadezhdin, Vishnyakov, Orlov, Ryazanov, Sokolov, Telegin, and also citizens Brusilova, Tikomirov, and Rachmanov were sentenced to death, and many others to various forms of imprisonment, various terms of imprisonment. Those who visited the Patriarch Tikhon in the Trotsky retreat in, in Samotek knew the big, stout, gesticulating, gesticulating quick-moving Bursa, Archimandrite, and Nempodist Telegin. When the confiscating agents appeared in the retreat, Archimandrite Telegin, in order to make it official, came out to meet them dressed in his ceremonial vestments, stated his protests to the communists, then took off his vestments and walked out of the church. At the inquest, Archimandrite Telegin de declared, I'm a monarchist by conviction. The judges became interested. How could you be a monarchist when there is no monarch? Do you belong to a party? I do not belong to any party. I am only a server of the holy altar. Apostle Paul said, submit to the existing authorities. I am submitting. I live quietly, modestly, like the rest, away from politics. Where do you practice? I was the chaplain of the staff of the 1st Don Brigade. At present, I have been entrusted with the house church of the Patriarch's Convent. Is that where you insulted the confiscating committee? Yes, I called the members of the committee robbers and assaulters. I am a server of the divine altar, and it is painful for me when the holy articles are removed. He acted staunchly to the last moments of his life. The priest who shared his cell related how impatiently he awaited his execution. I cannot wait to meet my Lord Jesus Christ. He was cheerful, and he gained the upper hand over his executioners. At last you came for me, he said. Sign here. With pleasure, he replied, signing his name with a special twist of the signature. The Reverend Zauzersky, also accused of resistance to the stripping of churches, when led from the court through Lubyanka Square in Moscow, blessed the greeting crowds with wide signs of the cross. The priests were shot in the ship of the Cheka, the name given to the small, dark, two-story hall resembling the hold of a ship and located in the center of the building of the former insurance company on Lubyanka, St. Uh, Lubyanka Street. Wide boards on the sides of the hall were used as beds for the prisoners. In the middle of the hall, there were several vaults formerly used for safes, now used by communists as execution chambers. Amazing was the behavior of the widows of the executed clergy. 
one of them with eyes sparkling from under a black headkerchief was saying to the other, how privileged we are, Matushka, how privileged. Our husbands received a wonderful death. They accepted the martyr's crown for the sake of our faith. Now we have only to pray for them. No, we need not pray for them. They are the ones to pray for us before God. There'll be times where we we have people around us, other Orthodox Christians, who are undertaking some sort of struggle. They're undertaking some new burden and they're struggling with it. And they might be having doubts. And it's so important for us. And it's so it's something that it might not seem like it's a big deal to us, but it's a big deal to them to give them encouragement. Like like the the, the relatives of the martyrs who would come and, and visit them and and tell them you have to keep going, you have to keep enduring. It's super, super important for us to give encouragement to people when we can see they could use it. I agree. This next section is a, it's a short section, it's one page. It's called Igumen Antonin. Igumen uh, Antonin came to the Solovki camp from the Simonov Monastery in Moscow. A former prisoner of the same camp relates the following about him. While I was in the Solovki camp, one of the prisoners there who worked at the fishery suffered a great deal from eczema on the legs. He was troubled with it for a long time. Then entering the church of St. Onufri, kept, kept open for worship by the free labor monks of the island, he saw a coffin with a deceased monk in it and addressed God with tears in his eyes. Jesus, if this is, if this now sleeping monk pleased you, won't you accept his prayers for me, a sinner, and cure me of my sickness? Coming to his lodging at the fisherman's house and starting to change the dressing on his leg, he discovered that there was no eczema on his legs. In his great joy, he related this to his neighbor and co-worker, Bishop Sophroni of Sel Selinginsk, and the latter informed us, the, and the latter informed us, the clergy who were nearby. The monk who had been buried that day was our co-brother by imprisonment, Igumen Antonin of the Simonov Monastery. The imprisonment of Igumen Antonin had just commenced in 1925, but he could not endure it. On account of his weakness, he had been given a lighter work, that of a sweeper of the monastery court. The unfortunate old man had caused some inconvenience to his neighbors in the cell by his disease and the abundance of lice on his body, and everyone was re was relieved when he was taken to the hospital where he departed to God, having stoically borne his cross to the end. Uh, that's the end of this section. And again, did your grace have any thoughts to share? I like carrying your cross to the end as a comment. Yes, that's what we're all called to do. And, and the one who will be patient until the end I'm doing this my own translation, so you might never recognize it. Uh, this one will be saved. This next section is the last section of chapter 18, and it's another short section. Professor Ivan Vasilievich Popov. Professor Ivan Vasilievich Popov, Popov was the founder of Petrology in Russia. He was the authority on the ancient pre-Augustine period, and his books on Augustine contained all the world literature of the latter. The first volume of 900 pages was published before the revolution. The second volume in manuscript remained in, in the safe of a Soviet bank. He was arrested in connection with the work he did for Patriarch Tikhon. At the direction of the patriarch, he was composed. Uh, sorry, at the direction of the patriarch, he composed the answer to Patriarch Gregory of Constantinople, who accepted the renovators and, and quote suggested to Patriarch Tikhon that he retire from the administration of the church in 1924. I. V. Popov was uh, confined to Solovki, where he remained from 1925 to 1927. I.V. Popov was the author of the historical document, The Memorable Note of the Imprisoned Bishops of the Solovki, Con Solovki Concentration Camp. On November 1927, I.V. Popov was transferred from the island to the continent and then exiled to Siberia, to a small place on the river Ob. At first, his living conditions were very poor and he was unable to pursue his scientific studies. After several months, he was moved to a better place, and there I.V. Popov worked at his treat treatise on St. Gregory of Nyssa. 
1932, sorry, in 1932, Ivy Popov was unexpectedly freed and returned to Moscow. Some book was being prepared for the academic edition and he had been chosen to translate a Latin text for it. In 1936, Bishop Bartholomew Remov was arrested and shot to death. Professor Ivy Popov, who had helped him to conduct studies in the Ecclesiastical Academy of Moscow, which existed without the government's permission, but not without its knowledge, was arrested and disappeared without a trace. Speaking of Ivy Popov, it is impossible not to recall his tes testamentary executor, a fine young man, Anthony Tivar, who arrived together with him in Solovki. Testamentary executor was a nickname given to candidates for, for the professional chair who were being prepared by the older professors to take their place. A. Tiavar of French ancestry was the pupil and intimate friend of Ivy Popov. They lived side by side, slept, ate, and took walks together. The pupil worked on the doctrine of Christ by Saint Athanasi the Great, studied and wrote in his spare time. Ivy Popov was a teacher in the Solovki camp school and taught the illiterate convicts the use of the alphabet. Tiavar worked in an office of the camp. They stayed at Solovki together until January 1928, when the young man was set free and went home. During the Holy Week of 1928, Anthony was made a monk by Archbishop Arseny of Serpukov in Arzamas with the name of Seraphim. Later, he was raised to the rank of deacon and then ordained priest. Later, uh, he lived in Moscow and performed a liturgy in a private home. He was assisted by his mother, a secret nun, Mother Panta, Pantaleimon, Pantaleimona. In, 19, in 1930, he was arrested and exiled to the Vyshersky camp, where he died on November 23, 1931, departing to his maker several years before his teacher. And that's the end of this section. And again, did your grace have any thoughts to share? An interesting uh, uh, thought that it, Gregory Patriarch, Patriarch so called, of Constantinople in 1924, the same year that the calendar was being changed, he sent a message to uh, Saint Tijuan telling him to retire as Patriarch. So uh, the, the devil and evil was really brewing already. Uh, thank you, Vespera. Did we have any thoughts or questions? Um, just a question. Um, right at the beginning of uh, of that section, uh, it, it mentioned that he was um, was it the study of petrology or something like that, which I haven't heard of. Yes. yes. Yeah, what does that mean? Patrology is um, the study of the fathers, the study of the fathers of the church. Um, remember, we read a general, I think there was a previous chapter in this book, which was a general register of all the bishops that had um, been martyred in, um, in uh, basically through, by the Bolsheviks. And there was something like, it was like 48 bishops or something um, that that were, it was told about how they were killed. And this next section, it looks to be a register of priests. Okay, no, actually it's in the title of the chapter. So general register of a part of the Russian clergy and laymen who suffered martyrdom at the hands of communists during church persecutions. Yeah, okay. And then in brackets it says, e eventually every city and every district should record details, detailed lists of their martyrs. And this section is so long, it's very long. I don't think we're going to be able to finish it tonight, but we'll get started. Arch Presbyter John A. Kocherov killed in Sarko Selo, November 1917, first clerical victim. Arch Priest A. Skipitrov of the Church of Saints Boris and Gleb killed in Petrograd. Arch Priest F. Ornatsky, Rector of the Kazan, Kazan Cathedral, killed in Petrograd. Archpriest Alexei Stavrovsky, prior of the Ad Admiralty Cathedral of Petrograd, killed on August 15, 1918 in Kronstadt. Archpriest John Vost Vostorgov, rector of St. Basil's Cathedral of Moscow, killed on October 23, 1918. Archpriest Peter Dovgenev, Dovgenev, 
the brother of Bishop Yermagen, the Reverend, uh, the Reverend M. Makarov and lawyer Miniatov, all killed together with Bishop Yermagen in 1918. L Lev Z. Kuncevich, diocesan missionary of Voronezh, shot in June 1918. Archpriest Gregory Pospelov of Kronstadt, shot in 19, 1918 for performing a service at the funeral of sailors killed in a rebellion against the communists, shot holding the ceremonial cross in his hands, which could not be forced away from him. Archpriest Alexander Vereskin, member of the State Council of the Vilno region, hanged on the gates of his home in Cher uh, Cherkasy in 1918. Leonid Nitsa, member of the Moscow Council, killed in Ufa in 1918. In the Svi Sviatogorsky Monastery, Izium district under Kharkov administration, confiscation of property and plunder started as early as January 19. The Monastery Brotherhood were forced off the land. Communists broke into churches wearing their hats, cigarettes between their teeth, talking obscenely while overturning the altars, drinking up, drinking up the church wine and taking away the sacred utensils. In one such visit, the bursar of a hermitage near the village Gorohovka refused to give out the monastery money. He was led out of the walls and shot near the gates. It was also then that a monk Israel was, was killed when he tried to flee. And when the highly revered icon of the Sviatogorsk Virgin Mary was carried from village to village, October of the same year, and the procession stopped for the night in the village of Berachi, the communists attacked the lodging there where the, where the priests were, killed the priests Modest and Irinarki, Deacon Theodet and their host and his daughter. Five corpses lay at the foot of the icon in a pool of blood. In Kharkov, an 80-year-old priest, Ambrose, was beaten with the butt end of the, of the guns before execution. The Reverend Dimitri was led to the cemetery and stripped naked. When he began to make the sign of the cross on his forehead, the hangman, the hangman cut off his right hand. It was forbidden to bury him and his body was left to be devoured by the dogs. The Reverend Gabriel Makovsky was cut to pieces because he reproved communist villainly. Uh, villainly? Reproved communist, uh, communist, maybe villainy is what it's supposed to say, because he reproved communist villainy. And when his wife requested permission to bury his remains, the communist first cut in two her arms and legs, then mutilated her chest before killing her. An old clergyman who interceded on behalf of a peasant condemned to death was whipped and chopped to pieces by swords. Afterwards, the Red Army executioner, with cynical pleasure, related how they had whipped a naked old man on the belly and on the back and how he bent with pain. In the Spasovsky Monastery, a sailor, Dibenko, arrested a 75-year-old Igumen, Igumen, Archimandrite Radion. On the first night, he was led to the fields and killed. One of the Red Army men bragged afterwards that he killed the prior by first scalping him, then bending his head and chopping his neck. Inspection of the corpse confirmed the soldier's story. In the, Aziz, in the Aziz, Azeum district, the village clergyman, the Reverend Longin, was arrested and taken to the city. On the way there, they cut off his nose, killed him and threw the body into the river. In the Kherson region, one clergyman was crucified. In the Tarek district, the Reverend John Riabuhin and many hostages were killed by swords. This execution presented a dreadful slaughter during which scores of hostages were cut down by swords in the darkness of the night on the edge of a pit into which they fell during the uh, into which they fell dead and wounded alike. The Reverend Riabuhin was still alive and during the night he was able to disentangle himself from under the pile of bodies and thin layer of earth. His moans were heard by the cemetery keeper who found him looking out of the pit and begging to pull him out and to quench his thirst. But the keeper's fear of the communists was so great that he, there was no room left in his soul for other feelings, and he threw a thicker layer of earth over the living clergyman. The moans ceased, and when several months later the pit was excavated, the corpse of the clergyman showed itself with raised arms, a mute testimony to his efforts to climb out of the grave. In the railway station Chap Chaplino, under the, under the Ekaterinoslav administration, Archimandrite Benjamin from Moscow was executed for interceding on behalf of a district chief condemned to die. 
The feeble old Archimandrite, who could hardly stand on his legs, was dragged to the place of execution over the station platform. He was undressed and the executioners divided his clothes among themselves, after which he was unmercifully beaten. The blows were so strong that one stroke severed his braid of hair. The Archimandrite, covered with blood, was silently praying, but the blows were purposely aimed at his arms to prevent him from making the sign of the cross. The torture lasted interminably until finally they cut off the, the unfortunate man's head. In the Bermut district, under the, under the same administration, the village clergyman, the Reverend Popov, was offered the chance to perform a funeral service for himself, and when he refused to do so, was shot to death on the spot. The Reds picked out the eyes and plucked out the beard of another clergyman of the same district before putting him to death. In the village Roz Rosden, Rostenvensky, Rostest, sorry, in the village Roz, Rosdestvensky of the Alexandrov district, the red soldiers chopped off the arms and legs of up to the torso of a local clergyman, and in this and in such state hung him by the by the hair on an on an acacia tree, after which they shot him and would not allow the body to be taken down for three days. In Ljubljana, under the Poltava administration, red soldiers took over the Spaso Preobrazhensky Preo monastery as, as billets and set out to steal and ridicule the sacred things. After a while, their commander ordered Prior Ambrose to call the whole brotherhood together. Some of the monks were absent at the time and only 25 men had been assembled. They were arrested and ordered to, to deliver the keys to all the rooms of the monastery. Then the monks were ordered to bring firewood and were informed that they would all burn at the stake. But the approach of the anti-red volunteer army frustrated their designs. There was no time to linger and hurriedly the arrested monks were driven to town to the railroad station where in the dead of night they were shot. The execution started with Prior Ambrose, killed by a shot from the revolver of Commissar B Bakai who was in charge of the guards. After that, the red soldiers began to shoot the rest. 17 monks were killed and the others only wounded simulated death. In the town of Poltava in the last part of June 1918, the reds arrested the Reverend Nil of the Poltava Krestovozdvizhensky Monastery. He was taken several times to interrogation. From the last, he returned badly, badly bruised. The escorting red soldier stated that the arrested priest had been so obstinate that he, that he refused to say anything and that they would be forced to spend 37 rubles on him, the cost of a bullet. Indeed, on the 4th of July, with two others, he was led out into the forest where all three were shot. The examination of the corpse of the priest established that the murder had been preceded by excruciating torture. The priest of Spasovskite Monastery, the Reverend Athanasi, when taken to execution, knelt in prayer, put the sign of the cross upon himself, and then, rising, blessed the red soldier standing in front of him with a musket in his arms. With two shots, the red executioner killed the pastor who had just blessed him. Outstanding in cruelty among the mass of executions was the murder of Father Nikolai Mil Milutkin, clergyman of the village Novo Nikolsky. He was falsely accused of inter interrupting church service upon learning about the passage of a group of captive red soldiers. It was said that he lifted the communion cup from the altar, came out with it to the entrance of the church and expressed his joy by singing the Paschal hymns. While appearing before the local checker, the Reverend Milutkin was subjected to beatings by gun butts and two sword strokes left a, a wound on his leg and removed half of his scalp. Upon petition from local peasants, he was released to them on pledge of honour, but two hours later he was again brought before the checker where the chairman fired one shot, one shot point, black, point blank and the other red soldiers inflicted numerous wounds with swords. As the floor ran red with blood, the Reds brought some dogs to lick it up and when they refused, whipped them. After that, they undressed the body and dragged it off to the River Don, babbling, float to Novochurskask. Tell the people there that we are coming next week. 
The following priests were shot after they had been accused of speaking badly about the communists and were unable to satisfy a request for payment of money. Archimandrite Yanadi at the Levengovsky factories, the Reverend Timothy Studnik, Novo Bamutovka village, the Reverend Konstantin Shegolev, Andreevka village, Victor, uh, district of Bamut. The Reverend Theodor Vasile, Vasile, Vasilevsky, Grigorievka village, a clergyman of the D Davidovka village. In the Papozna village, the Reverend uh, Drago, Dragozinski was sentenced to death for a sermon in which he pointed out that Julian the Apostate before his death said, you have conquered Galilean. In this, the communists suspected an allusion to themselves. Atrocious torments were inflicted on Krasovsky in Papozma, on the on the Reverend Bulahov in Perezhez, Perezhezna, and Shepelev in Lysyshank. In one short period of time, 43 clergymen were killed in the province of Kuban, and within a small part of the Stavropol diocese. And sorry, and within a and within a small part of the Stav Stavropol diocese, 52 priests, four deacons, three psalm readers, and one elder. In the village Sergeyev, under the Stavropol administration, the Reverend Patrykin was killed in June 1918 by the military commissar, commissar after being falsely accused of urging the people to refuse a contribution of 90,000 rubles to the Red Soldiers. The Reverend Alexander Podolsky was killed for performing a public prayer for Cossacks before their taking the field against the communists. Uh, but before killing him, he was taken around the Stanitz, Stanitsa, mocked and beaten, and then cut down on the city dumps. One of his parishioners who came to claim his body for burial was killed on the spot by a drunken red soldier. The Reverend Gregory Dmitrievsky of the Smolensk village of the Stavropol administration, led out of the village to be executed, asked permission to pray before death. He knelt and said his last prayers aloud, while the Reds jeered and ordered him to finish quickly. But they did not let him finish his prayer. They rushed at the kneeling man with swords in their hands and chopped off first his nose and ears, then his head. The Reverend Gregory Nikolsky of the Mary Magdalene Monastery of the province of Kuban was taken by the Reds on June 27, 1918. He was led out of the gates of the monastery and shot through the, through the mouth, which uh, which they had forced him to open, shouting, "We will also give you the sac. We will also give you the sacrament." In the Barsukova Stanitsa, in the spring of 1918, Reverend Gregory Zlatuski was slain for serving a thanksgiving, asking God for deliverance from the Reds at the request of the Cossacks. In the Putnaya Stanitsa, Arch Presbyter Ivanov, who had been serving liturgy in the Stanitsa for 30 years, was killed by Red soldiers for pointing out in his sermons that communists were leading Russia to destruction. In the Voznesensk Stanitsa, Holy Trinity Church Parish, the Reverend Alexei Pavlov, over 60, was killed on the town square because he descended from Cossacks and once served in the guards. In the Udobny Stanitsa, the Reverend Theodore Bereznovsky, over 50, was killed by Red soldiers who forbade his burial for speaking disparagingly of communists. In the Ust Labinsky Stanitsa, the Reverend Michael Lizitsin, Lizitsin was tortured for three days from Friday to Sunday. With a noose around his neck, he was led over to the Stanitsa, mocked and beaten so hard that falling to his knees, he begged them to finish him. He was killed on, tw on the 22nd of February, 1918. His wife was obliged to pay 610 rubles for the privilege of burying him. His body showed more than 10 wounds and the head was cut into pieces. The Reverend John Krasnov of the Donetsk Stanitsa, 49 years old, was slain during a thanksgiving for his parishioners who were taking the field against the communists. The Reverend Alexei Milit Militinsky of the Novo Sherbinsk Stanitsa was killed for reproving the communists and for performing the thanksgiving for Kozak parishioners before they marched against the communists. The Reverend Alexei Flaginsky of the of the George George uh, Georgia Afipsky Stanitsa, 56 years old, 
after being mocked and beaten, was led out of the Stanitsa and killed. His body was discovered a long time afterwards. The Reverend Ivan Prigorsky of the Nezamaevsky Stanitska, 49 years old, a socialist, was led from the church to the church square on Saturday before Pascha, where he was assailed, beaten, his face mangled, ears and nose cut off. All this accompanied by vile abuses. Covered with blood, barely alive, he was dragged out of the Stanitsa, and there he was killed by a blow that smashed his head. The Reverend Zolotovsky, a retired and venerable old man over 80, living in the Nadezka, Nadezda village, was seized by red soldiers during his after-dinner nap, led to the public square dressed in feminine garb, after which he was ordered to dance in front of the crowd, and upon his refusal he was hanged on the spot. The Reverend Paul Kalinovsky, 72, a retired priest residing in Stavropol during the invasion of the town in October 1918, was arrested and sentenced to be whipped because some of his grandsons were officers of the White Army. He died under the blows. Father Superior Eugene uh, Igumen of the Alexandro Sversky Monastery in the Lodino Pol district under the, hmm, this is the words cut off here, Olotets maybe, Olotets administration, and five fathers of that brotherhood were also victims of the communists. In the first hectic days of the revolution, a, a band of looters utterly, uh, I'm uh, sorry, a band of looters uttering abuse and blasphemy on holy ground demanded from the Igumen, the treasurer and the bursar all the keys to the monastery storehouses. The fathers protested and tried to protect the property from the plunderers. The band resented it and sentenced the monks to be shot. They forced six fathers, the father superior and the elders, to dig the grave pit for themselves in the yard of the monastery. As soon as the pit had been dug, they were placed along the edge and were aimed at with rifles. Because it was the third day of Pascha, the monks asked the executioners to allow them to sing a short Paschal hymn, Christ, Christ is Risen. They were forbidden to do so, but they began to sing anyway. Um, at that moment, a volley of shots rang out and the monks fell into the pit. The father, Bursar's, the father Bursar's long black beard had turned white while he stood before the pit. So told the eyewitnesses, novice Ivan, who observed all this from the loft where he had hidden himself. In the village of Bangar, the communists appeared at the house of the Reverend Dmitri Senenev and demanded food. After the meal, they promised that the priest would not be molested and left, but he, but he was sent for afterwards and in the morning his corpse was found outside the village. In the village of Bezopazny were, uh, were killed a priest of the Serafimsky Church, Leonid Soloviev, 27 years old. The deacon of the Dmitrievsky Church, Vladimir Ostry Ostrikov, aged 45 years, and psalm reader Alexander Fleginsky, 51. They were killed by local communists who took them to the burial grounds of plague-stricken cattle. They were ordered to dig the grave, then were cut with swords, mutilated, and, and while still alive, buried in the shallow graves. No charges had been presented against the priests. It was just found necessary to do away with them. Psalm reader Alexander Donetsky of the Holy Trinity Church of the Vost Vostochki Stanitsa was sentenced to prison for being a member of the cadet, uh, that is, Socialist Party, but on the way to jail was killed by the escorting guards. The Reverend John Malachov of the of the Hutor, okay, which is a peasant resettlement farm, okay. Um, uh, uh, so the Reverend John Malachov of the Hutor Teneka in the Black Sea region, together with his wife, was arrested by red soldiers, taken to the Mingrelsky Stanitsa, and there shot after much of mockery, especially at the wife, according to the report from a local priest. In the Plastunovsky Stanitsa, the Reverend George Boy Biko Boyko was, was martyred. There was a terrible wound in his throat, as if torn asunder by something. In the Korinovsky Stanitsa, the Reverend Nazarenko was killed. In Krasnodar, province of Kuban, in one night, at the orders of B B Budeni, six priests were killed. This Vasily Ver 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 Verishki, a student of the Kazan Ecclesiastical Academy, 
arrived at his native village in the Stavropol diocese, visiting his father, the psalm reader. There he loudly and publicly denounced the communists. Eventually, of course, he was taken. On the way to the place of execution, he announced that he would never accept communists and would never be reconciled to them. Then, after a prayer, he departed to his maker. The Reverend Serapion of the Novo Alexandrovsky Stanitsa, Kuban province, was the pastor of the so-called outsiders, the non-Cossack population of the Stanitsa, the poor people, the element that yielded the first communists. His parishioners liked the kind, unmercenary, cheerful young pastor and protected him from any harm. He was the pastor of the proletarian classes uh, and an enviable position at that time. Once, he was driving a horse by himself along the railroad tracks while a train was slowing down before approaching a station. A shot was fired from a window of one of the coaches and Father Serapion fell dead into his cart. The horse was stopped at the station. The people were indignant and angry. The train was searched for the murderer, but of course he was never found. The Reverend Michael Krizanovsky of the village Velichevo of the Stavropol Diocese on the border of the Astrakhan Steppe was distinguished for zealous service, sincere devotion to, the, to religion and dis disinterest in material gains. He scathingly exposed in his sermons the communist ungodliness and violence. He was the spiritual flame which burned away evil and he was of course doomed to death. One Sunday, uh, one Sunday after the divine liturgy in front of a throng of people, he was taken directly from the church by out of town communists, placed in a cart and driven out of the Stanitsa. The people wept. Father Michael had had time to quote the words of the Saviour to his parishioners. Do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. Outside of the village, he was raised on bayonets by the Reds. He was only 28 and left a widow and two children. In the Kherson region, three priests were crucified. In Yalta, the Reverend Sergei Shukin was brutally killed. In Crimea, a, a gang of communists grabbed three priests, the Reverend Nikolai Popov, the Reverend Agathon Garin, and the Reverend Alexander Kazanchev, and after long tortures and mockery, killed them. The Reverend Kotorov, at the evacuation of Cher Cherdin, was seized by the communists, who undressed him and poured water over him in the winter frost until he turned into an icy statue. The sufferer did not let out a single groan. Archimandrite Benjamin, last igumen of the Solovki Monastery, led the life of a hermit in a solitary peasant's hut in the suburb of Archangel. Local communists burned the hut with its occupant, first sealing the door and windows. Archimandrite Matthew, rector of the Perm Ecclesiastical Academy, was slashed to pieces with swords. The Reverend And Andre Zimin of the village Cherny Gov Govka, Nikolosk Usur, Usur region, and his family were killed in 1918. The Reverend John Litvinsev of the village of the village Vish Vishnevka, Nik Nikolsk, Nikolsk Usar region, and his family were killed in 1918. The Reverend Peter Diakonov of the Nad Nadezdinsky factory, Verhoturia district, under the Perm administration in 1918, was buried up to his head in the ground and then shot at. Father Theodore of the village Golish, Golish Manov, Golish, Golish Manovsko, under the Tobolsk administration, was killed in June 1918. Father Paul of the village Ustinitsa, Torinsk district, under the Tobolsk administration, was killed in June 1918. The Reverend George Paragachevsky of the village Ivanovki, Amur region, was shot with explosive bullets in 1918. The Reverend Simeon Ionin, Troitsky district, under the Orenburg administration, was shot in 1918. Archpresbyter Nikolai Rusinov was shot in Kustantai, Orenburg Diocese, in 1918. Archpresbyter Alexander Zemlian, Zemlianitsin, the Reverend John Evstratiev, Archpresbyter Peter Homogortsev, the Reverend Michael Penkovsky, and several others were taken away from Chelyabinsk in 1918 and vanished without a trace. The clergy who fled with the anti-communist army falling back from the Voronezh region later returned and took up their posts, but many of them were shot. 
One of the prominent priests, Father Mitrofan Davitsky, was seized before he reached his home and shot inside of his parents, wife and children. We'll pause here just because it seems we'll, we'll probably finish this section, I guess, next week or whenever we have we next uh, resume this book. Um, did anyone have any thoughts or questions on anything that we've read and discussed this evening? In, in listening to these stories, it seems that a lot of these people who committed these atrocities were workers. They weren't um, trained military men. And with the executions that occurred with the clergy, um, you know, when they were sentenced by a court or they were summarily executed um, by soldiers, um, they were just executed, I say just, but without the torture. But it seems that when these, uh, the Red Army um, was involved and these, I don't know how they became members of the Red Army, it doesn't seem like you needed any particular qualification, but they weren't content to just execute um, the clergy and even their their women, the wives of them, you know, that they had to torture them uh, to it and commit. It, it's stuff that you, it's really even hard to listen to. What is it, Vespita, that makes these people who previously were probably just living very simple lives, um, you know, working class people, is it because they've got this power um, that, that, that they want to do, instead of just killing someone, they want to just uh, butcher them and commit really, really horrendous things. I, I can't quite wrap my head around that. Yes, it is amazing. We have a lay expression here in Greece that don't give uh, your finger to the devil because he'll take your hand. What it means is that if we allow some space for the devil to enter into us, this is why the small sins are dangerous, then the devil slowly starts to gain control of us. These people had a little demon in them. And then when the devil organized this whole revolution, everything evil came out. Uh, I don't think normal people without a demon in them could do such uh, atrocious acts. I mean, they're beyond comprehension. So we're resuming here. Priests of the city of Voronezh, cheered up by the example of their prelate Archbishop Tikhon, who had not left the city during its occupation by the communists in December 1919, stayed and almost all of them were shot. In the Voronezh diocese, there were 160 priests shot at that time. In the, Kharkov, in the Kharkov region, during a period of six months, from the end of December 1918 to June 1919, 70 clergymen were killed. Archpresbyter Konstantin Moshinov of the town Yelitorovsk Yalut, was killed in Tumen in 1919. The Reverend Leonid Matraninsky was shot in the Vernev. Vern Dinskaya prison in 1919. Deacon Alexander Nevsky was killed in Perm in 1920. The Reverend Nikodim Petikultsev of the village of Carmen under the Tomsk administration was butchered in prison with a kitchen knife in October 1920. Nikolai Mikhailovich Varzansky, diocesan missionary of Moscow, was shot in 1920 in Moscow. Before his death, he wrote from prison to his relatives and friends. He anticipated death calmly and gladly, as if it were a pleasant journey. Archpresbyter Alexei Voskresensky of the village Chas Chashi, Kur Kurgan district, under Tobolsk administration, was killed in 1921. Archpresbyter Nikolai Tikomirov of the village Vedenskoy, the Kurgan district under the Tobolsk administration was killed in 1921. The Reverend Vladimir Selev Selivanovsky was killed in the village Shatrovo Yalutorovsk district under the Tobolsk administration in February 1921. 
the Reverend Anatoly Maslenikov of the Uspensky factory, Tiumen district, was shot in Tomsk in 1921. The Reverend Viktor Nik Nikovsky of the Kurgan district was killed in 1921. The Reverend Nikolai Marsov was killed in the Tobolsk region in 1921. The Reverend John Snegerev of the Sloboda Ust Laminsky under the under the Tobolsk administration was killed in February 1921. During the peasants' anti-communist rebellion of West Siberia in 1921, nearly a hundred priests were shot by the communists in the Tobolsk region alone. Arch Presbyter Serafim Chernik of the city Nikolaevsk on the on the Amur during the consecration of the willow branches on the eve of Palm Sunday, was thrown into the river dressed in, in his priest's vestments. The Reverend Serafim Sarikov of the or Sarichov of the Gonda Tievka Stanitsa was shot to death near uh, shot to death after Paschal liturgy in 1921. The Reverend Joachim Frolov of the Mikhail Mikhailovsk village under the Amur administration was burned on a haystack outside the village in 1921. Only a metal cross remained on the heap of ashes. The Reverend John Moslovsky of the Verny Poltavki village under the Amur administration was shot through the window of his house on September 7, 1921. The Reverend Theodore Arka Arkhangelsky of the Mikhailovo Semenovsky Stanitsa under the Admor administ administration was shot in 1921. Archimandrite Sergei Sheen, secretary of the Moscow All Russian Council, was killed on August 12, 1922, in Petrograd. Priests of Moscow, the Reverend Zayozersky Dobro Dobrolubov, Nadezdin Vish Vishnikov, Orlov Fryazinov, Sokolov and Archimandrite Anemdopis Telegin were shot in Moscow in May 1922. <clears throat> in connection with the confiscation of church valuables in 1922, 8,100 members of the clergy of different ranks were shot and tortured to death. And there's a listing of the numbers here in different regions. So Archangel Region 49, Astrakhan 84, Petrograd 36, Vologda 27, Perm 34, Ivano Voznesensk 54, Kostroma 72, Tver 94, Moscow 36, Tula 61, Nizhny Novgorod 68, Simbirsk 47, Kazan 24, Ufa 28, Minsk 49, Smolensk 62, Vyatka 41, Ekaterinburg 29, Novgorod 68, Beskov 31, Vladimir 81, Ural 49, Saratov 52, Tambov 41, Orlov 78, Kursk 68, Kharkov 98, Poltava 124, Ekaterinoslav 92, Don Region 97, Crimea, Crimea 44, Taganrog 36, Black Sea 37, Vladika Vladika Vladikavskaz, Vladikavskaz 72, Samara 61, Chelyabinsk 20, Semipalatinsk 12, Omsk 19, Bar Barnol 441, Chernigov 78, Odessa Kherson 191, Mogilev 61. Bobrusk 29, Ekaterinodar 69, Stavropol 139. Altogether, 2,691 white clergy, uh, that would be married, so married clergymen, 1,962 monks, 3,447 nuns and lay sisters, altogether 8,100 victims. That's just from the church confiscations of 1922. Um, <clears throat> names of the slain without without detailed data. Professor Porfiry Amfitiatrov in Belarusia, Archimandrite August, Augustine Vicar of Or Mon. I don't know what Or stands for. Orlov uh, Monastery. Uh, Father Superior Gervasi. 
Uh, sorry, I, I can't. I don't know these. There's abbreviations of the monasteries and the, the districts here, but I just don't know that. I'm sorry. So Father Superior Gervasi of Brian Uspensky Monastery, the Reverend Gerasim Brian uh, of. Sorry, I just like. I'm not going to get these. Uh, I'm not going to be able to read these um, abbreviations properly. Novice Anthony, Arch Presbyter Joseph Smirnov of the Kostrom Diocese, Archpriest Paul Dernov and, and children of the village of Elabug, the Reverend Paul Kushnikov of the Novgorod Diocese, <clears throat> the Reverend Peter Pokrivalov of Tolsk uh, Diocese, the Reverend Theodore Afanasiev of the uh, the Reverend Michael Shafranov of the town of Sevastopol, the Reverend Vladimir Ilinsky, the Reverend Vasily Ugliansky, the Reverend Konstantin Sniatinovsky, Deacon John Kostorsky, the Reverend Nektari Ivanov, the Reverend Matthew Olinik, Archimandrite Nicholas Orlov, Rector of the of 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 a um, some of a seminary, the Reverend John Perevaskin, the Reverend Innocent Pliaskin died in prison in Vladiv Vladivostok in 1923. In the village of Dedino Sebev district, agents of the Cheka killed the priest during the divine service. In the village of, Zas Zasis, uh, of Zazistino, uh, of Zasitino, of the same district, cattle had been stabled within the church cattle had been stabled within the church at the request of the peasants the church was reopened but in revenge the agents murdered the clergyman in front of the altar in the border village of Slobodka the agents pulled the priest out of jail undressed him and hung him on a tree the head of the GPU announced that he would hang anyone who attempted to save quote the Pope and shouted to the freezing priest let let your God protect and save you in the village of Turk, agents of the Cheka crucified the priest at the holy gates of the altar and then shot him. The Reverend Andronik Lubovich of the Nikolaev on Amur, the Reverend Michael Novgorodsev of the Peshansko Ozersk village, and the Reverend Emilian Shelchkov of the Muraviev Hutor, former deacon of Bishop Anthony Krapovitsky in Kharkov, were tortured and shot in January 1924 by the executioner Bezlepkin, chairman of the special court session. Father Andronik's hair was twisted on seven inch nails. The Reverend Modest Gurbanov was killed near Hyla in 1929 by communist raiders on the Trerechia. Tre 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 Arch Presbyter Elias Zotikov of Vestments of vestments in the Church of Jesus the Savior in Moscow, who formerly had officiated in the USA, was shot in Vladimir in 1930. 1930. When Metropolitan Sergei came to an agreement with the Soviet government and gave orders to all the churches to pray for that government in the liturgy of the divine service, there were certain bishops and priests who were unwilling to follow his orders and separated from Metropolitan Sergei. They retained one of the biggest churches of Petrograd and many people streamed into it. When the government issued an order to lay a tax on candles, the churches estranged from Metropolitan Sergei withheld the use of candles. This incident caused the arrest of Archbishop Dimitri, some priests and 15 parishioners. They were kept in jail for a whole year. In July 1930, the investigation ended. Archbishop Dimitri, six priests and several parishioners were sentenced to 10 years in prison and two priests, Father Sergei Tikomirov and Father Nicholas Prozorov were shot. Archpresbyter Michael Cheltsov, a clergyman of Petrograd, was several times arrested and condemned to be shot, but every time the sentence would be revoked at the last moment and he would be set completely free. The last time he went through such an experience, he was quite, he was quite prepared for, for death and was gladly expecting it when he was again, pa quote, pardoned. He even told his friend, I am no longer happy to be free Yet I have been so used used to the idea of leaving for another world that it almost seems I am already there, while this world is strange to me. But he did not have to wait long for a new arrest and another sentence to be shot. And this time the sentence was carried out on Nativity Day. One of the guards who was present at the execution later related to the widow of Father Michael, 
What a man he was. As they led him to his death, he sang hymns of the Nativity of Christ. They say that on the day after the execution, an order came from Moscow to, quote, free him in view of the lack of evidence of crime, end quote. The Reverend Sergei Lyapunov, arrested in February 1932, died in exile. The Reverend Serafim Tiavar died in the Vyshersky camp in November 1931. The Reverend Sergei Aronsky, former archdeacon of the Livatsk church, disappeared without a trace from the Krasnodar prison. Archpresbyter of Vladimir and Archpriest Strumilo were killed in Ekaterinburg. Archpriest Dmitry Pizov and Karp Shubov were shot in the Rostov prison in 1932, together with Metropolitan Seraphim, and at the same time, 120 married and monk priests were also shot there, and Professor Theodor Salnikov died from starvation. Archimandrite Polychrony, Polychrony Zapruda, Presbyter Konstantin Ordinsky, and the Reverend Nicholas Katosinov were shot in the Krasnodar prison in 1934, together with Bishop Philip Gumilevsky for rejecting the ruling power of Metropolitan Sergei of Moscow. Archpresbyter Professor A. Ksenio, Ksenio Fontov, a graduate of the Petrograd Ecclesiastical Academy, and Archpresbyter N. Budnikov were arrested in 1933 and accused of counter-revolution and resistance to Soviet power. They were exiled for 10 years to a camp in the far north of Russia, Kem Camp. Both tried to flee from the camp, but were caught by the guards and delivered to Petrozavodsk, where, where upon orders from the central government, they were shot in 1936. The Reverend Varsanufi of the Transfiguration Church in Strelna died in exile in 1935. Ivan V. Popov, Director of Theology, Professor of the Moscow Ecclesiastical Academy, after having been arrested in 1936, disappeared without a trace. Ivan P. Ezikov, pa uh, psalm reader of the Transfiguration Church of Strelna, died in exile in 1937. Archpresbyter Dmitry Kirinov, prior of St. John Chrysostom's Cathedral of Yalta, disappeared without a trace from prison in 1937. The Reverend John Hodorovsky was shot in Arzamas in 1938, after having emigrated, uh, sorry, after having emigrated, he had crossed the border back to Russia in 1921, had been arrested and exiled. In exile, he had been secretly ordained priest. He fled from the labor camp and roamed the country for a long time. Upon arrival in Arzamas, Father Hodorovsky found asylum with a nun, Terentieva. For a while he had to hide, but in time he ceased to be a fugitive and began his activities as a priest. The search of Father Khodorovsky's room by communist authorities disclosed various literature, and he was charged with, with spreading anti-Soviet pamphlets through wandering religious preachers. Several nuns were arrested with him, and they were also charged with anti-Soviet agitation. All of the accused were declared to be members of an organization headed by Metropolitan Joseph of Petrograd. It's quotes and uh, organization in quotes, members of a quote organization headed by Metropolitan Joseph of Petrograd. Archpresbyter Xenophon Arkhangelsky, who had given refuge to all the wandering preachers, was shot in Samara in 1938. In the register of the new Russian martyrs may be included also those killed by communists beyond the Russian borders. The Reverend Iaklovetsky Iakla, Iakla, was, was killed by Reds in Serbia in 1941 or 42 in one of the villages of the Pajar, Pajarevaci district. The Reverend D.H. Novoseltsev, with his wife, daughter, and a, and a Cossack labourer, was butchered by communists in the village of Milicinci near Valevska Kamenica, a Serbian town in 1942 or 43. And that's the end of this chapter. Did uh, your grace have any thoughts to share? When we read these lives of the new martyrs, um, I really don't have thoughts to share so much as just the same thing over and over again, my amazement at the struggles 
of so many martyrs uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution. And um, first of all, how many clergymen, how many monastics? Uh, there are numbers somewhere, but I don't know them off to, offhand. Um, it, it's amazing uh, that new the heavens were filled with new stars because uh, these martyrs became immediately saints of our church and whether they were canonized then or not. And they filled the heavens of the last times with martyrs. Uh, who knows when the next time we'll see such martyrdoms again, or will the martyrdoms continue to be like they are in our present time, uh, mostly a, a, so, a slow stifling of the church by the world and worldliness. The system of communism um, from its beginning um, put itself against Christ. It was a God-hating re regime, this communism. Uh, they hated the monarchs of the world they, and they hated their belief in God very much. So. Um, are there good uh, things from communism? I can't think of any. I did know a couple of true Orthodox who had some kind of communism, communistic set of beliefs, but they liked the church. But in general, um, I'm sorry to say that um, communism um, does not go with a Christian lifestyle, uh, even if the communists claim, as I've said before, that they're doing what Christ say, says. Um, they do the exact opposite, actually. Christ says, if you have two tunics, give one away. They say, you have two tunics, I'm going to take one or both of them from you. Uh, it, it was a, a whole... Um, the whole world, I think, at that period of time, the 20th century, was in upheaval. Uh, many of the Slavic nations fell to communism um, one by one, being the biggest being um, uh, Holy Russia. And we saw in Greece and in the Greek world the change of the calendar. Um, a little before that, in 1917, the genocide of the population of Pondos. Um, the exchange of populations in 1922 be between Turkey and Greece. Uh, and like I said, the change of the calendar in 1924. So it was like um, orthodoxy was trying to be snuffled out by uh, evil forces. But glory to God, um, his church uh, will prevail. And then uh, we can also not see ecumenism as not being also a movement of the ugly powers of the world um, with the Rockefellers beginning um, yeah, the whole ball rolling in 1919, the 1920 epistle of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. So all these things were moving together and they're organized. And I think the different faces of the same demon, which is hatred for the Holy Church and the, the wish to um, uh, to obliviate the Holy Church. But Christ says that the gates of hell shall not prevail uh, against the church. So uh, this is very true and the church will go on and does go on. And we must take these holy martyrs as gifts from God. Uh, people to intercede for us, people to give us strength in our days. Let's read the, uh, first of all, and it, this is printed in Orthodox Life magazine, 1981, volume four, and it's called An Epistle to All the Faithful Children of the Russian Orthodox Church Abroad Concerning the Approaching Glorification of the New Martyrs of Russia. It starts off with a quote. Thy church, arrayed with the blood of thy martyrs throughout all the world, as with purple and fine linen, doth cry out to thee through them, O Christ God. Great is the feat of martyrdom. In the Holy Gospel, we read the call of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, directed to those who wish to be his followers. 
Strive to enter in at the straight gate, Luke 13, 24. Strive, strive, walk the path of struggle, carry out the Christian struggle in your life. In other words, the Christian must be a struggler in his life. The ways and aspects of Christian struggle are diverse. Turning to the lives of the saints, we find their examples of holy, God-pleasing life under the most varied conditions of life. Among the saints glorified by the church, we find people of the most disparate ages and widely different states, from mighty sovereigns and exalted hierarchs of the church to simple hermits and recluses and those living in the world with families. Yet with all the disparity of the external forms and conditions of their life, the spiritual foundation is one and the same, an all-embracing love for Christ and an unshakable loyalty to him throughout all the temptations, tribulations and persecutions which they had to bear. In particular, this undaunted loyal loyalty to Christ shines forth clearly and triumphantly in the struggle of those whom Christian antiquity called witnesses, in Greek, martyros. This struggle, the struggle of martyrdom, is the struggle of those who bore witness to their loyalty, commitment and love for Christ by dying for him and did not spare even their very lives. And what beautiful, edifying examples of the feat of martyrdom we find in the lives of the, of the saints. Behold, the holy great martyr George the Victorious stands before us. A handsome, noble youth, wealthy, a favourite of the emperor, he was his faithful servant and could rely upon achieving a great measure of, of so-called success, in quotes, in quote, success in this life. But when he had to bear witness to his faith and loyalty to Christ, he turned from all the good things of this earth, manfully went forth to the tortures of martyrdom and death, and received a martyr's crown from the hand of him for whom he had suffered. Behold, the beautiful Christian virgins, the great martyrs Barbara and Catherine, noble, richly gifted and comely themselves, they did not spare their youth, beauty or their very life, and in them were fulfilled the words of the apocalypse, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. One must keep in mind that the holy martyrs, men and women both, after courageously enduring the dreadful tortures and torments to which their tormentors subjected them, went forth to their death as to a banquet. They went not as ones defeated, but as victors. The torturers used all the means at their disposal to induce them to renounce Christ. And only when they saw that their efforts were in vain did they send the faithful witnesses of Christ to their death, an act of sheer impotent malice. Although in the history of the Church of Christ we see, we see examples of martyrdom in every age of her existence, prior to the Russian Revolution the feat of martyrdom took place chiefly in the first centuries of Christianity when paganism strove to annihilate, to annihilate the Church with iron and blood. What we see now is something quite different. With the appearance and rise of God-hating communism in Russia, persecutions of the faith were initiated which have been unprecedented in their cruelty and scope. In the words of one church writer, Orthodox Russia found itself on Golgotha, the Russian church on the cross. Of course, as was the case in antiquity, there have been incidents of apostasy. Yet at the same time, the Church of Russia and the Russian people have produced a multitude of cases of the manful endurance of torture and death for faith in Christ, indeed so great a number as to be incalculable with any precision. For it is beyond doubt that there have been so many cases of martyrdom throughout the long years of communism's existence in Russia as to surpass any other era in the history of the human race. Here we are not speaking of hundreds or thousands, but of millions who have suffered for the faith an unprecedented and incredible phenomenon. Throughout man's entire history, there has not been such an occurrence as we now behold. There has not been such an outpouring of evil. There has not been such a mindless and open rebellion of creation against the Creator as we now see in our much suffering homeland, which has been enslaved by the communists. Never in history has there, has there risen to heaven such an abominable, mindless stench of blasphemy against God and all that is holy as in Soviet Russia. Yet if the enemies of God and the church, demonic in their malice, have defiled our homeland, the Russian land, with their loathsome blasphemy and hatred for God, it is at the same time cleansed of this defilement by the sacred blood of the new martyrs of Russia, who have suffered for the faith and for righteousness. With this blood, the land of Russia is abundant, abundantly bedewed. 
bedewed, sanctified, and purified of the mindlessness of the godless and those who struggle against God himself. The Holy Church, glorifying the new martyrs, says that by their blood she is adorned as with purple and fine linen, the richest, most beautiful, and costly raiment. With this splendor of the feet of martyrdom, the Russian Church is now adorned, that church which has not acknowledged the thieves or so-called authority of the godless, has refused any dialogue and compromise with it whatsoever, and consequently bears the cross of faith and confession. The day of the canonization is drawing nigh. The glorification of that innumerable assembly of martyrs and confessors of the faith whom the Church of Russia and the Russian people have revealed to, to the world. It will be a day of the greatest triumph of the Orthodox faith. Not only in Russia and in the Russian diaspora, but throughout the whole world, in every place where there are faithful children of the Orthodox Church. And every Russian Orthodox person must prepare himself to take part therein in a fitting manner. Now, with the approach of the long-awaited day of the glorification of the new martyrs, one often hears how the people say that the Church abroad does not have the right to glorify them, that this can be done only by the whole Church of Russia in its entirety. Of course, this would, this would, be, this would be so if the Church of Russia were free, but we know well that the portion of the Church of Russia, which has not accepted the communist so-called authority as the lawful authority in Russia and has not submitted to it, has gone into the catacombs, and it is not possible to ask its opinion freely. And the hierarchy of the so-called official church has subjected itself to the authority of the godless of the godless and acts according to its orders. Therefore, it cannot be considered the real spokesman for the much suffering, persecuted Church of Russia. Thus, the Church abroad considers it her own responsibility to do what cannot now be done in Russia. And we know that from beyond the Iron Curtain, many, many cries have reached us, not only expressing sympathy for the glorification of the new martyrs, but begging that the glorification be performed as quickly as possible. Great, yea, great. Yea, vast is the assembly of the new martyrs of Russia. It is headed by the sacred name of His Holiness Patriarch Tikhon and the murdered Metropolitans Vladimir and Benjamin. Moreover, Metropolitan Vladimir occupies a special place therein as the proto-martyr, whose martyrdom con constitutes the beginning of this glorious band. At the same time, quite a special place in the company of the new martyrs is occupied by the imperial family, headed by the Tsar Martyr em Emperor Nicholas Alexand Alexandrovich, who once said, if a sacrifice is necessary for the salvation of Russia, I will be that sacrifice. Much is now being said of the glorification of the imperial family. Many, many of the faithful children of the Orthodox Church and not only among the Russians, await the day of glorification with joy and impatience. But there are also, also audible voices of dissent which speak against the glorification of the imperial family. And in the majority of cases, these voices say that the murder of the imperial family was a purely political act, that it was not a martyrdom in the sense of dying for the faith. Is this the case? Turning to Russian history, we see a great number of examples of how the church has glorified as saints of God many holy princes who were murdered. Moreover, their murders were in no wise dependent upon any demand to renounce their faith in Christ the Saviour. For example, from the life of the holy passion bearers, princes Boris and Gleb, we know that we know with what base and criminal considerations their murderers were directed by Sviatopolk, who is rightly called the Accursed. But the question of the renunciation of the faith did not enter into in, did not enter into it in the least. Yet the church glorified them first of all for their holy and righteous life, which ended with the holy brothers' suffering and death. If Saints Boris and Gleb were thus glorified, as were many others, then it is all the more natural and correct to view in a positive light the question of the glorification of the imperial family. First of all, now, when the memory of the imperial victims has been cleansed of the filth and slander hurled at them in the years immediately following the revolution, it has become known to the whole world that the family of the late Tsar Martyr was a model, a most splendid example of a true Christian family. In particular, this became clear when we learned how the imperial family lived in their grievous imprisonment before their repose, and also when letters written by members of that family from, a, from prison were published a priceless treasure, 
which they have left behind for the edification of the Russian Orthodox people who honour their sacred memory. But this is not the crux of the matter. One should not forget that the communist malefactors, in slaying the imperial family, did so to annihilate the very memory of how Russia had lived for the many centuries of her existence. They have tried to smash, to put an end to, to destroy within the much-suffering Russian people that radiant spirit by which holy Orthodox Russia lived, the spirit of the Orthodox state, and to implant in it the abominable spirit of God-hating and fratricidal communism. The criminal murder of the imperial family was not merely an act of malice and falsehood, not merely an act of political reprisal directed against enemies, but was precisely an act principally of the spiritual annihilation of Russian orthodoxy, the aim of which was to instill an unnatural and evil communist spirit in the Russian people. The last Tsar was murdered with his family precisely because he was, a, he was a crowned ruler, the upholder of the splendid concept of the orthodox state. He was murdered simply because he was an orthodox Tsar. He was murdered for his orthodoxy. Russian Orthodox people, children of the Russian church abroad, we are preparing ourselves for a great triumph, a triumph not only of the Russian Orthodox church, but of the whole church universal. For the entire Orthodox church is one in all her parts and lives a single spiritual life. Let this triumph of the Orthodox faith and the beauty of the feet of martyrdom be not only a church-wide triumph, but a personal triumph for each of us. We call upon all the children of the church abroad to ready themselves for it with earnest prayer, preparation, confession, and the communion of the holy mysteries of Christ, that our whole church with one mouth and heart may glorify him from whom comes every good gift and every perfect gift, God who is wondrous in his saints. Metropolitan Philaret. And before we uh, maybe have some comments here, maybe it's, I'll read also the act of glorification of the new martyrs of Russia. <clears throat> In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the Council of Bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, representing the only free part of the Russian Orthodox Church, with reverence discuss the exploit of the martyrdom and confession of the innumerable believers in the Russian land who have suffered from the hands of the godless, the persecutors of the faith of Christ. From the days of the great Prince Vladimir, the Russian people with all its heart has accepted the holy Orthodox faith. This faith inspired numerous holy princes, hierarchs and ascetics, sanctifying the Christian order of Russian culture. These were founded on the Christian principles set forth in the sacred scripture and tradition of the, of the Orthodox Church. Being realized in Russian national life in various degrees in various periods of history, these principles have continued to exist in all the layers of the Russian people, from the Tsar to the last pauper, for the course of more than 900 years. However, during the past two centuries, instigated by the enemy of our salvation, the anti-Christian principle of revolutionary atheism has directed all of its, all its strength and means towards the annihilation of these principles in the Russian people. From 1917, beginning with the sin of the whole people in violating the oath given before the cross and, and the gospel of loyalty to faith, Tsar and homeland, there began to be put into practice the uprooting by the atheists of the whole orthodox spirit in the government and in the people's way of life, both of which had turned away from God. This evil was attained by means of a cruel persecution of faith and of the orthodox way of life. All layers of the population were made victims of this process, from the Tsar and the hierarchy to the simplest believers. Right away, from the very beginning of the revolution, there began a persecution and mockery of the imprisoned Tsar and his family, and almost simultaneously, an assault against the representatives of the church, bishops, pastors and believers. In the very first year of the revolution, our church was made purple with the blood of the overthrown Tsar with all his family and the members of royal blood who, who were within the boundaries of Russia, as well as of numberless believers. Numberless believers. Later, to them were joined the victims of persecutions from the renovationist schisms and the confessors who did not agree to any compromise with the anti-Christian authority in the attempt of the leaders of the Moscow Patriarchate at that time to serve at one and the same time both Christ and Belial. An innumerable choir of many millions of martyrs and confessors was formed. 
During the 64 years of Soviet dominion, tens of thousands of churches and monasteries were destroyed and millions of people were martyred because they preserved their orthodox faith and did not bow down to the idol of materialism. Bowing down in prayer before all of them, the Council of Bishops decrees that there should be joined to the choir of the saints all the martyrs and confessors who have suffered from the godless in Russia. Hierarchs, clergy, monks, nuns, and all the Orthodox people who have been tortured and killed for the Orthodox faith and the principles of Holy Russia. The names of these saints are so numerous that they can be fully known only to the all-knowing God, and the Council of Bishops will have to supplement the list of names with those of other people who have struggled for the faith to the glory of God. A special place in the choir of the Holy New Martyrs is occupied by the Tsar Martyr Nicholas II as the anointed of God, the bearer of the idea of the Orthodox state and his family. Therefore, a special service is to be dedicated to them on the day of their murder, the day of sorrow, July 4 17. Together with the reading at the liturgy of the prayer of repentance established earlier to, to be read at Panahitas. To all these holy martyrs and confessors, we shall offer praise, entreating them that by their intercession at the throne of God, they might obtain for Russia deliverance from the godless and a rebirth of orthodox life, and that by their example, they might inspire other children of the Russian church also to enter on the path of struggle for faith and piety. The general feast of the Russian new martyrs and confessors is to be celebrated on the Sunday between the 22nd and 28th of January, according to the Orthodox, that is, old calendar. Uh, okay, Orthodox in brackets, old calendar. The memory of separate martyrs and confessors should be performed on the day of their blessed repose, when it is known, and otherwise on the day of the general feast of the new martyrs. Chairman of the Council of Bishops, Metropolitan Filaret, Filaret and members of the council. Um, and sorry to put you on the spot, Father Joseph, but maybe you don't have any thoughts to share, but did you did you have any thoughts to share on these two um, encyclicals? The first thing, the, the setting of the, the two days, uh, the New Martyrs and Confessors on Russia, <clears throat> the Sunday between the 22nd and the 25th of, of January, that's on the church calendar, um, is, first off, it's it's... Uh, to be celebrated on a Sunday. And when I talked to various clergy years ago as to why that date was given, and specifically on a Sunday, they were, the response was along the lines of the council understood that Sundays are the best attended days uh, for services. And the Feast of the New Martyrs and Confessors of Russia is of uh, such import to the Church of Russia, similar to say the all, the service for all saints or the All Saints of Russia. Those are both on Sundays, um, but it is appointed to be served on a Sunday. Now the Sunday that this one was chosen is the Sunday that is closest, I believe, to the martyrdom of Saint Vladimir, who was the first hierarch martyred by the Soviets even while the, uh, the All-Russian Council of 1917-18 that restored the Patriarchate, even while that was in session, he was murdered in St. Petersburg. And so that's why that day was chosen. The other thing is that the uh, service for the Royal Martyrs was chosen specifically uh, on the day that uh, Tsar Martyr Nikolai was, was martyred. Uh, it's interesting to note that the royal martyrs, basically, there's, uh, they were in two groups. The royal family in the Apatyev house in the Katerinaburg, they were murdered. They were shot, basically, in the basement on the 17th. And then the following day, Grand Duchess Elizabeth and those with her were, were martyred on the uh, 18th. They were thrown into a mine shaft and hand grenades were dropped down. And after the White Army uh, recaptured the area where they were buried, or where they were, were martyred, uh, they had found that uh, th those martyrs had not been killed by the hand grenades, and that uh, Grand Duchess Elizabeth had uh, bound up some of the wounds of the different princes, and they basically all died of uh, exposure and thirst and, and, and uh, 
as a result of the martyrdom and, and, the, and the attempt to kill them, but that uh, they, they died somewhat later than that. And both uh, the bodies of Grand Duchess Elizabeth and Nun Barbara, who was uh, encouraged by the communists to leave her, but refused, they were uh, taken out of the, uh, the mine shaft and transported to ultimately to the Holy Land where they reside in, I believe it's a Gethsemane convent uh, on, uh, in, in Jerusalem. And when we went on the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, we were able to venerate uh, their memory at their, at their reliquaries. Um, his point about why are the royal martyrs being glorified that the the worldly wise will tell you oh, well you know they were the tsar and especially the tsarina were horrible rulers they were bigots they were uh, they were trying to what the, their action they were divorced from society their actions were just destructive of russia and that kind of stuff and so this is all political those are lies that the communists spread and that the West, while it may have opposed communism in principle, was more than happy to accept because the West hates a, um, uh, an aristocracy, not an aristocracy, a, a autocracy, every bit as much as the communists did. And so the, the intent to uh, malign the, the memory of the, the royal martyrs is alive and well to this day by those who hate uh, an orthodox way of life. Um, so those are my thoughts on that. Then uh, that initially, I mean, his epistle, I think the first epistle was talking about the Russian church found itself on Golgotha with millions persecuted uh, and murdered in an un, which is unprecedented in history. That's a caution to us, because if it happened there at that time, it can certainly happen with us in our place in our time. And in fact, the the world as a whole is is not getting better. If anything, it is getting more and more evil and demonic and attacking anybody of faith. And his point about the, the idea that uh, this is a, an attack on God itself. In the past, persecutions were not against uh, a divine uh, essence or a divine principle. It, they, uh, even the Romans were substituting pagan gods. There was something beyond just the, the worldly that they would try to get people to believe in, and that was the organizing principle of society. Today, the organizing principle of society is completely worldly. It is attempting to deny any kind of a spiritual reality. We are simply animals, just like any other animal. And uh, yeah, we might have some advantages over the other lower animals, but basically our, our, our essence is of the most base and animalistic. That is an attack on God. Back in the 1930s, there was a council of bishops that was talking about the need for all of the Russian people to pray for repentance for the murder of the Tsar and his family. And the Council of Bishops in their act of glorification mentioned that when they say that there was this prayer of repentance that's read at the Panahitas. The Panahitas were for the royal, the royal martyrs that were served up until the glorification. And that prayer of repentance was incorporated into the service of the royal martyrs. Uh, they also added a uh, prayer for the salvation of Russia to the liturgy, which the, the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia uh, up until they decided they wanted to be Soviet, um, would have after the prayer of fervent or the litany of fervent supplication in the divine liturgy. And uh, the Russian True Orthodox Church continues this prayer to this day 
uh, in a thread except for on great feasts, uh, such as Pascha or Nativity or Patronal Feast of the Parish. Those prayers of repentance and for salvation of Russia are very important for bringing to mind in the faithful the need to pray for repentance. And that the repentance for the martyr or the murder of the, the royal family was one of the conditions that the Russian church outside Russia always laid down for there to be a resolution of the mess that was made of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church by the communists at a future uh, all Russian sabor, such as what had uh, taken place in 1917. That uh, all Russian sabor, of course, never did take place. And when the Morocco submitted, they dropped all pretense of requiring any kind of repentance. And they basically just submitted to the Moscow Patriarchate as to the mother church, which in fact, they said the Moscow Patriarchate was their mother church. And that's in direct contradiction to what the council was saying. And by the way, uh, in the council were uh, Archbishop or now Metropolitan uh, Mark of Germany, uh, Loris, the former uh, Metropolitan who died. Those are the two who were alive, who had survived long enough to, to submit to the Soviets. Uh, and they both basically repudiated everything they'd done before. Did I also understand correctly, though, that talking about the the union with the between the MP and Rokor, the official ecclesiology of the MP was that Rokor was schismatic, wasn't it? And oh, yeah. I don't. In fact, uh, when they they had their fourth all diaspora sabor in San Francisco, and I think it was two thousand six, they issued an epistle where they were uh, harping on how we have to reunite. And I basically pointed out that if they really believed what they were saying, they had to acknowledge that from at least 1946 or 47, when there was a that uh, council in uh, Cleveland, that uh, the Soviet church had declared them to be schismatic and without grace, that, that they needed to admit that they were schismatics and without grace. They were not happy with that. So, so the MP had not only declared that Rokor was was schismatic, but also that they did not have grace-filled mysteries. Did I understand that correctly? Correct. And in fact, oh. uh, I believe some of the, uh, well, I don't remember if any of the Rokor bishops or clergy who returned to the Moscow, or who turned to the Moscow Patriarchate uh, were reordained. But I do know that um, the Patriarch of Istanbul uh, received a couple of old calendar Greek bishops who had received ordination from the Rokor, and he ordained them deacon, priest, and bishop. So, what the, do you know? What, whatever happened of, of that then, of, of the fact that that statement, that con, that so-called confession, was kind of you know had been hanging in the air for sixty years from the MP, did was by Rokor going into communion with the MP, was that a, an a, an admission from the Rokor hierarchs that they considered themselves to be in schism and that, that they were returning to the bosom of the church in, in 2007? Or am I being unfair? You can't accuse the Rokor leadership, the bishops or the senior priests of being intelligent. They aren't. Uh, if you look at the negotiations that they, they had two committees, one on the MP side, one on the Rokor side, and the Rokor one was led by uh, uh, who's the uh, who was the rector of uh, I can't remember his name um, the rector of Holy Trinity he was made a bishop a couple of years ago um, anyway the in every instance the MP uh, committee got the Rokor committee to admit that whatever position differences there were the MP position was the correct position. The Rokor got nothing from those negotiations. However, they're not about to say that they were schismatic and without grace, because if they're going to do that, the whole thing collapses. But I mean, if you look at the the whole idea of their of their returning to the Moscow Patriarchate, how many first hierarchs can a church have? 
in my understanding of what a first hierarch is, there can only be one first hierarch. And yet the Rokor claims that they have a first hierarch under the MP. There, it's, a, it's an inconsistency. It's a contradiction. But that's not a problem for them. They, they do not care about that kind of stuff. Right. Okay. So essentially that was that particular detail was basically kind of just ignored and, and swept under the rug. And it does like, I remember, I think I actually got that idea about the, uh, the official ecclesiology of, of the MP that Roker was schismatic. I think I actually got that from something that you wrote. And I, I read that for the first time last year and it's the first time that I've ever read that. And so I'm assuming if it's the first time that I've ever read that, uh, argument that probably no one really noticed it at the time of the union. No one really, it wasn't a popular argument that was brought up. Well, there were no real arguments brought up about it by anybody other than the people who were pushing for the submission. Everybody else had been excluded and, or, or had left. They'd been driven out. So that by 2007, uh, in particular, anybody who was uh, still around in the church essentially was fine with, with the, the submission. Uh, they don't expect consistency or, or in, intellectual integrity to reconcile conflicting positions. The whole point of ecumenism and the whole point of Sergianism is you paper over all that stuff and you just go along with what the, the authority was saying it needs to be done. And to this day, you'll find people in the, in the Rokor MP who are saying, well, you know, I don't know this is not maybe right, but I don't know about it. Uh, I know I trust my bishop, and if there's a sin, it's on him, which, of course, ignores the responsibility each and every one of us has for uh, guarding the faith and being responsible for our souls. Uh, I wouldn't want to stand before the throne of God at the last judgment and try to claim that somebody else was responsible for my heresies, if, which would be the position that they're in. Well, I mean, I thought the the fathers are pretty loud and clear on this. If if your bishop is a heretic, your they don't tell you to stay. They don't tell you to fight from within. They tell you to run from the heretic. Isn't that correct, Father? Well, there is that, but again, you know, who cares about the canons? Only the ones that uh, are convenient are the ones that get remembered by the worldly wise. Um, thank you, Father. Let's see, did anyone have any, any thoughts or questions on anything that we've read or just discussed then? I've got a question for Father Joseph. It's regarding um, the Royal Martyr uh, family. Uh, I can't remember what year it was, but um, Moscow Patriarchy, they claimed that they found bodies of Royal Family. You probably heard about it. Um, obviously, yeah, we all know. 1997 or 1998. Yes, that's uh, around that time. That's correct. And it was big, massive um, noise around it, and everyone was going and worshiping and the place and the bodies and everything. And I always knew that it's, it, something is not right here and this cannot be right and this is not true. Um, so now we know that they're not um, authentic and it's not real and it's been just a touch. I just want to ask, why did they do it? Obviously, apart from making money and making, I don't know, a noise around it or making them important. Is there any other reason behind it? Why did they have to lie? Why they had to create all this drama around it? That's an excellent question. Um, and it's a part of a broader issue. The Soviets tried to malign the, the royal martyrs. They tried to deny there were any new martyrs. And they did that for decades. And with all of their efforts to suppress veneration of the, the new martyrs, and particularly the royal martyrs, people were uh, uh, collecting in Ekaterinburg, and they were serving services to the royal martyrs even unofficially. 
And the, the Soviets are anything, but they're not stupid. They know after all these years, we've not been able to suppress. They tried that in the 20s when, uh, when they were trying to just exterminate Christianity, and they realized they couldn't. So what did they do? They co-opted it by first giving the living church and then ultimately the Moscow Patriarchate. They knew they could not suppress veneration of the royal martyrs. So what do you do? You glorify them. And you say, well, they're ours. And you'll note that when they did that, they did not admit that they themselves were responsible for it. They said these were errors of the past. And they didn't even really condemn Lenin, who was directly ordering it, because Lenin was obviously the, still the, the uh, be-all and end-all of the, of the communist Soviet regime. And so they, uh, they, they set it up. They do, they, they're good at doing show, and that's what they did. They may put on a show. Mm-hmm. They are more afraid of expressions of faith outside of their control than they are of anything else because they know that that can topple them. Maybe it's worth kind of just noting this, and I'm hoping this recording can go on YouTube, so this part of the recording, for, for anyone else who's out there. Um, it seems to me that's better that if we see people, we, we, we interact, the church interacts with, with quite a few people who are interested in the catacomb church, but they're interested in true orthodoxy. They, they, they understand that ecumenism and Serginism are heresies. They, they understand, like they just, they can see the direction the Moscow Patriarch is going, much Moscow Patriarch, which is towards a union with the papists. They can see these things. They're so obvious and they don't even try to hide them. And, um, but it's it's only a fraction of these people that actually can successfully make the jump to 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 become members of 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 our church or i'm assuming of other churches too and it seems to me that one of the common barriers one of the common pitfalls that these people fall into their spider is they try instead of just trying to escape themselves for the salvation of their own soul they've got they've got some like group a little a clique that's around them um, or they've got family members and they don't want to just come themselves. They want to bring others with them. And I'm wondering this, but if your grace can comment on this and if it is a trap and if it's, um, I'm actually, I'm wondering if your grace can comment on this. Cause it seems to me like this is, this is a poor strategy and every person who wants to save their soul, if they, if they recognize the outside of the church, they have to go full steam ahead to to get out themselves, and then they can worry about if they want to try and uh, convince others to to come with them. What, but what does your grace have to say about that? Run, flee, save your own soul. We all want everybody to be saved. Yes. Is it possible? No. You run. You flee. Leave those who deny our holy faith. Go to those who belong to. Uh, the true church. And um, if there is, um, if they follow you, good, but you have to flee. You have to um, not be in communion with those who have betrayed Christ. 